Texas. And then on to Baltimore, and uh, he's been uh, in Detroit for many years as their uh, number one voice, one of the great baseball broadcasters, Ernie Harwell. And uh, Ernie, I know you're covering uh, the series for uh, CBS, and I welcome you to our little playoff preview. Thank you, Jack, and it's a pleasure to see you and uh, see Mel Allen again. You're looking good, Melvin. You look so good I could hug you, and I wouldn't <laughs> say that publicly, <laughs> normally. Well, I guess... Uh, it's a big game here, and we're all looking forward to it. I know I am. It's been a good series, really. These two teams have played well. They've alternated with victories, and it's one of those things that uh, it might be one pitch tonight can settle the whole thing. You didn't bring Fedrich with you, did you? No, but uh, I imagine either team would like to have him. He's been great. He's been a great thing for baseball. He practically our franchise out there in Detroit. He did such a great job, and they gave him a new contract, incidentally. They gave him a bonus for this year, and then as a separate deal, the Tigers... Uh, and Mark and his dad got together on a three-year contract for the next three. Well, he was really deserving. There was one ball player who really did bring people into the stands. When he pitched, you had near a full house every time. Jack, I've never seen a man with the charisma that he had, and uh, he became almost an overnight legend, you know, with a couple of uh, national TV appearances. Of course, regionally and locally, he'd been uh, pretty good. And then uh, he went on that uh, game of the week once, and everybody all over the country was talking about him. Happened to be against the Yankees, too, that right. night. And, Mel, the thing about it, the guy is so natural and uh, so good. He's handled himself in every way, just perfect, on the field and off. And uh, if you had staged something like that, it would have fallen flat. But he's natural, and it's just worked out perfectly. Did he do that in spring training, or is that something that suddenly yeah, well, came Yeah, he on? was uh, talking to the ball and doing it. But, uh, you know, nobody noticed it too much because he wasn't even on the roster. He was just a minor leaguer trying to hang on. And then when he finally got his start, and I think Ralph Houck... Uh, handled him beautifully because he didn't get him in there too early where he might get bombed, you know, and uh, set him back in his career. Instead, uh, he babied him along, and it was about the middle of May before he got a starting assignment. Uh, that's one thing about Ralph Howick that I always noticed. He's very good with young uh, players. I think he's the best with that, and with the kind of team we've got, he's excellent for it because he's got the most patience of any manager I've ever worked with. And uh, he's forgiving, and he's uh, all for the player. John, before you get back in here, I just want to say one thing. With Fidrich uh, doing what he did and uh, getting the baseball world on his side and excited, it was good for baseball as well as for Fidrich personally. John and I were talking the other day about a guy named Tommy Byrne. And that's about the last pitcher I can remember used to do this sort yeah. of thing. He didn't talk to the ball, but he would talk to the hitters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were, he'd look in, get the sign, but he'd still uh, ask the hitters, when do you want, a fastball or a curveball? And the hitters look at him like he was crazy, but he would stand out there and say, look, I don't have all night out here. There are rules. Yeah. I got to throw the ball now. What do you want? <laughs> John? Well, I, I was just thinking when Ernie is standing here, this is a, a playoff, and Ernie has done playoffs before. And, of course, everyone remembers uh, Russ Hodges on radio because <laughs> Mr. Orwell, I guess, was on television when Bobby Thompson hit the home run. You were doing the Giant games, and that was the third game. That was just like this fifth game, a never-say-die game. The winner goes on the World Series. The loser goes home and, and cries in their beer for the next few months. I, I, now, I don't know this. I guess that's the most exciting game you've ever done. Oh, yeah, by far, because, uh, you know, on that one pitch, the whole season rode, and it was uh, so electrifying, and... I really think it's the biggest moment in uh, in baseball, the biggest single moment, with all due respect to Hank Aaron's uh, seven fifteen. You know, we knew that was coming. This thing also had a lot to do with the pennant race. It had everything to do with it, whereas uh, Aaron's blast is record-breaking as it happened to be, it didn't mean anything as far as the season was concerned. Ernie uh, did the, uh, as I said, he's been the number one voice with the Tigers since, I guess, uh, the late 50s? Yeah, 1960, I went to Detroit from Baltimore. Uh, Ernie, you, uh, of course, did the American League Championship Series uh, when Billy Martin was the manager of Detroit against uh, Oakland, and you uh, did uh, uh, the fifth and final game that uh, Oakland, I believe, won one nothing mm -hmm. to take all the marbles. Uh, Detroit had won two straight at home. And so uh, you've been in this situation uh, before, and that was a tough loss for Detroit to take, a one nothing loss at Tiger Stadium. It was a tough loss, especially since they'd lost the first two games of that series and then came back and won the next two. And looks like it looked like they had a real chance. And I did the first playoff series in 69 uh, between Minnesota and Baltimore. That wasn't much of a series. The first two games were great, but the third one was a very bad ball game, and, and Baltimore swept it. Well, I know you fellows have a lot of things to do. 
Nice to see you again, uh, John and well, Mel, and good luck to you. Ernie, thank you, Mel. Ernie, it's always good to see you. Brings back a lot of wonderful memories, and uh, brings back a great memory of one of the finest fellows I ever worked with, and uh, you too, Russ Hodges. Yeah, he was a great friend of everybody's, and we all miss him. Good luck to you. Thanks a lot. Ernie Harwell there, one of the many uh, broadcasters who uh, broke in under uh, Mel Allen. And that was a pretty good team. You and Gotti were a heck of a team. Uh, you and Jim Woods, uh, you and the Scooter, you and Red Barber. And a lot of great broadcasters worked under you. Yeah, we had a lot of fellows uh, started out with us, then they'd move on when a top job had opened somewhere else. And uh, it naturally made us feel good. As a matter of fact, the advertising agency that handled uh, our games would often send men out here who had just graduated college to learn production. And some of them are now in Hollywood as directors and uh, uh, outstanding TV directors. And all. It, it makes you feel uh, sort of good. We had one fellow, though, from Harvard. I have to tell you this. Please. He, he was a Harvard graduate. But he didn't know anything about baseball. And he'd sit outside the booth, but he'd bring a book with him. And uh, the crowd could be yelling, but he never would look up. He was still reading his novel. <laughs> and... Uh, He'd get up once in a while to make sure that we did uh, the right commercial at the right time. That's all he ever did. He didn't care about sports. But then, of course, I don't expect everybody in the United States to be as interested in sports as, uh, let's say, you and I are or the fans are. It is 25 minutes after 7 in New York City. Now, the crowd is filing in uh, on a very, very chilly night. Now, the Yankees and... Uh, Kansas City have already had their batting practice. Uh, Kansas City is taking their infield now. The Yankees will be taking their infield shortly. The starting pitches are expected to be Ed Figueroa and Dennis Leonard. Uh, I say expected to be because it isn't official until the lineup cards are exchanged at home plate just before the ball game. Uh, we'll be on with our playoff preview till about 8 o'clock, and the ball game will be beginning shortly after that. Our playoff preview is being brought to you by Emory Air Freight and Carte Blanche. And we'll get back with more right after this message from Emory Air Freight. Have you ever gone to the airport to get your package on a plane? Taxi! The airport, please. Uh, I don't know what it is about this cab, but it just refuses to go to the airport at rush hour. Probably afraid of planes. Taxi! When you finally get there, you're almost sorry you did. Could either of you gentlemen tell me where the World International Counter is? Sure. It's right over that way. No, no, Charlie. It's over that way. And when you get to where you're going, you have to be lucky to get your package to where it's going. Hi. I'd like to get this package on your next plane to Fargo, North Dakota, please. And why are you shaking your head? See that plane taking off? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was our next plane to Fargo, North Dakota. There's an easier way. Call Emory. We'll pick your package up and rush it to the airport. And instead of your package waiting for a plane, chances are you'll find a plane waiting for your package. You'll also find that Emory goes to more places both here and abroad than any other air freight company. Hello, Emory? Help. Emory Air Freight, the shortest distance between two points. The next time you have an appetite for fine steak, go directly to the assembly at 16 West 51st Street in New York and carte blanche it. The Assembly is one of the many fine restaurants in New York where your carte blanche card will allow you to spoil, indulge, and treat yourself to the kind of food that nobody can make at home. Dinner always tastes a little better when you have it with style, with your carte blanche card. Because people know that carte blanche denotes more than an average measure of distinction and taste. With a carte blanche card, you can travel with style, too. You can carte blanche your airline tickets, carte blanche your rented car, carte blanche your hotel bill, even carte blanche a vacation tour through Cartan Tours. Keep your card with you wherever you go and carte blanche your way through over 250,000 doors across the country, including the assembly restaurant. Carte blanche it. You'll know you're going first class and so will everyone else, too. This is WMCA Strauss Communications in New York, your exclusive uh, radio station for New York Yankee playoff games. And should they win tonight, the World Series. I'm John Sterling, along with Mel Allen, our final playoff preview, I can guarantee you that. One way or other, it's going to end, and I hope we have some World Series previews and post games for you along the way. And Mel, uh, Yankees going to take infield now. The crowd's starting to cheer them. Mel, I know you have another guest in the booth. 
I was just going to say the crowd uh, was cheering our guest, but uh, he happens to be from Kansas City. The Philadelphia Athletics, of course, have uh, a great background in the history of baseball. They eventually became the Kansas City Athletics, and that's how I got to know Kansas City. That didn't happen. I don't know whether I'd ever gotten to Kansas City, and I say that respectfully, although I did uh, some uh, college football games in and around that area. But I was delighted. It was one of the places I most enjoyed going to. And among the reasons, I met one of the finest broadcasters and one of the nicest guys that I ever met in our profession or in any profession. His name is Bruce Rice. He broadcast the A's games for a long while, currently doing the um, Kansas City Chiefs football games. But he had to be here tonight to see what the hometown team was going to do. Bruce? Get on the microphone. Mel, it's real good to be with you. We go back, I go back to the years when I was doing uh, Kansas City Athletics, and you remember, as do I, they were the farm team of the New York Yankees, uh, Arnold Johnson to Charlie Finley and so forth, but my most memorable uh, remembrances certainly have to be a baseball show called Baseball Central with uh, Bill Stern and later Mel Allen. I never had so much fun in my life as I did on those. It was always a pleasure to be able to bring up a point in uh, the sports world and then uh, flash out to wherever yes. it happened. And That's right. And when you came on, you were right to the point and gave us the story beautifully. What's your feeling about uh, tonight's game? Mel, I'd have to say I feel a lot better about tonight than I did last night. And I think it's because our players and coming out on the team bus from the hotel tonight our team players, uh, I got the opinion they're loose, a lot looser than they were, for instance, in game one back in Kansas City last Saturday. And I think, too, that they all know that they have beat regardless, and this is no dig at Ed Figueroa or anybody else, Kenny Holtzman or anybody else, but they just felt yesterday they beat the best in Catfish Hunter, so why can't we go all the way and, and prove to a lot of people they're wrong? Were there any comments about Catfish's uh, performance uh, last evening relative to the opening game? Well, uh... No, not really. Our, our guys last night when I talked to them just seemed to think that uh, Catfish in Kansas City and Catfish here yesterday was not overpowering, wasn't throwing as they have seen him in the past. Did they expect him to be pitching tomorrow? No, I think quite I far, mean uh, yesterday. Yesterday, I think they were looking at uh, feeling it would be Kenny Holtzman and were indeed, Mel, they were surprised that it was Catfish on because they thought they'd come back with a fifth game if necessary with Catfish. John, step in. Well, you know, Mel, Bruce was saying, uh, it was also uh, affirmed in the newspapers today, usually a manager, especially in the short series, doesn't want to comment on what the other manager is doing. No one wants to give anyone any fodder to boost the team up. Whitey Herzog said he was really surprised. He said, it isn't a second guess. So I couldn't believe that, uh, that Hunter was starting. And by the way, Bruce, we talked about it on our show before the game. And I thought it was natural to go with your best to try to lock it up. And I know a lot of people uh, disagree with that. And then again, I thought that split off would start, uh, start yes. tonight. I don't know if he still won't, but I, I imagine Dennis Leonard will start. Does that right. surprise you at all? No, uh, the only thing that was surprising was the fact, well, Whitey said after the game yesterday, if I hadn't gotten split off up to pitch, he would have been my guy today. But the fact that he got him up and he did throw out there in the bullpen, he said, I'll start Dennis Leonard. But he said, I won't be afraid to bring split off in at any time. And he said something else that was rather interesting. He said, do you think Mingori could come back? And he said, I think he can. And if I need him late in the game tonight, I'll go to him. Well, I bet they'll use uh, everybody they have and uh, move the pitchers in, lefties and righties. Both teams have a lot of balance on their pitching staff, a lot of you know, left-handers and right-hands they can bring in in certain innings and in certain situations. One of the things that Mel and I talked about before yesterday's game, uh, not having seen the lineup card, uh, uh, Whitey Herzog uh, made immediate changes to uh, yes. see if he get a little offense in. He put Rojas in, he put Jamie Quirk in, he moved Paquette over to left field where he's been playing more this year, and uh, I really like that managing. He knew he only had that game if he lost it, and so he made the changes. The old shakeup system. That's right, and I think I think it's interesting to note here's a guy like Jamie Quirk, who is a product of the farm system, who a couple of years ago, our procedure tried to get to Notre Dame and said, look, you'll be my starting quarterback for three out of the four years you're there. And at the last moment, he decided to cast his lot with the Kansas City Ball Club as a shortstop. Well, he uh, could not make it at shortstop. Now they're thinking of him as a third baseman or an outfielder, perhaps a first baseman. But you can't knock fellows like John Mayberry out. But Jamie Quirk came through yesterday. Cookie Rojas, on the other hand, 
Whitey's uh, feeling on that was uh, a logical one. He said Frank White is great on the artificial turf and has the speed and quickness to operate on the artificial turf. But he said here on this turf, you want a cool head and you want a, a, a veteran like Cookie Rojas. And Cookie is he's up in his 30s, as you know, Mel, and uh, probably going to be one of those players you don't protect in the upcoming expansion draft. But he's a guy in this situation that's the ideal man. You can't beat experience in a playoff ball game or in a playoff series, even though you may trade the man at the uh, end of the year. The thing that is interesting to me, I uh, don't necessarily go by the numbers. That doesn't always prove the point. But still, Kansas City beat the Yankees, if my memory serves me correctly, four times in six games here, here. this year. Whereas they split even, I think, in six games out in uh, Kansas right. City. Seven and five overall, that's right. And uh, the players, when they come to Kansas City, we feel, Mel, that we have a beautiful sports complex there, both Arrowhead and Royal Stadium in that Harry S. Truman sports complex. But the players make no bones about the fact that they just do not like that uh, that carpet. Fellas that you and I know, uh, well, Chuck Thompson comes to mind down at Baltimore, can't stand the stuff, you know, and there are a lot of people that just don't like it. And Billy Martin and his ball club happen to be one of them. I'll tell you one man that I do like though on your ball club John and I have been talking every day you talk about the stars in these playoff games whether it be the divisional playoffs or the World Series people look to them to provide all the excitement but here comes a guy he hadn't thought too much about although in this particular instance he has been uh, a sort of a catalyst uh, in the infield for the A's just like uh, Rick Burleson was uh, for the uh, Red Sox last year. And you know who I'm talking about, Freddie Poptek. He's been just sensational in this series. The little guy has just had, uh, you know, he was up and down for a while. And I think one of the greatest trades we ever made. And he, of course, came over from Pittsburgh with a guy named Bruce Del Canton. And uh, he's just done a super job. You look out there and you see the guy and you wonder how in the world he's got an arm like he does. He plays that carpet in Kansas City Mill like nobody you've ever seen. And I think he and Cookie Rojas... One of the finest, sweetest-looking double-play combinations you've ever seen. Of course, uh, Pontek, I think, has played great, though, against the Yankees over the uh, over the last few years. You know, all those great trades, uh, Pontek, Rojas, uh, Amos Otis, Chime Mayberry, uh, Cedric Tallis engineered all those deals. And now, of course, that happens in all sports. So you don't know where you're going to be uh, tomorrow, but... Uh, Cedric Thomas is off. It's about 15 feet yeah, behind right. us. <laughs> and he built Kansas City up in no time at all. Bruce, we want to thank you very much for coming by. And and uh, I'm glad that Mel had a chance to introduce us. Nice to see you, Bruce. Sure glad to see you. A lot of good luck to the Chiefs. I'm sorry Hank Stram had to leave. He's one of my favorite coaches. But I think he'll do a good job down below. Thanks. We're going to get a little bit inside on one of the broadcasters on the network tonight, Reggie Jackson from Alan Goldstein of the Baltimore Morning Sun in just a moment. Our playoff preview is being brought to you by Carte Blanche and Emory Air Freight, and we'll get back with more right after this message from Emory Air Freight. I'm in gotta sleep. It's late. I can't. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Your factory in Fresno should have just received that package you sent. That package that was holding up a production line of who knows how many people, costing you who knows how much money. So you can't sleep. I wonder if they got it. Got what, Herman? Who are you talking to at 2 o'clock in the morning? Uh, nothing. Forget it. Yeah. And when you try to count sheep, you wind up counting yeah. dollars and yeah. cents instead. Maybe I should call them. Maybe you should call them, Herman. But call them in the other room. So you decide to call your air freight company just for a little assurance. But nobody's home. Maybe you got the wrong number, or maybe, what's worse, you got the wrong air freight company. Because at Emory Air Freight, no matter what hour of the day or night you call us, we'll not only answer the phone, we'll answer your questions. So the next time you want an air freight company that's in when you call, call us in the first place. Emory Air Freight, the shortest distance between two points. Yankee Stadium, scene of the fifth and final American League Championship Series game between the Yanks and the Royals. The winner goes out of the World Series, the loser goes home. And a lot of excitement. It's a terrible cliche to say excitement is building here, but it really is. The crowd is filing in. There'll be 56,000 people here on a rather chilly night in the Bronx. The next time you have an appetite for fine continental food, go directly to Brussels Restaurant at 115 East 54th Street in New York and carte blanche it. Russell's Restaurant is one of the many great restaurants in New York where your carte blanche card will allow you to spoil, indulge, and treat yourself to the kind of food that nobody can make at home. 
Dinner always tastes a little better when you have it with style with your carte blanche card. Because people know that carte blanche denotes more than an average measure of distinction and taste. With a carte blanche card, you can travel with style, too. You can carte blanche your airline tickets and carte blanche your rented car. Carte blanche your hotel bill. Even carte blanche a vacation tour through Cartan Tours. So keep your card with you wherever you go and carte blanche your way through over 250,000 doors across the country, including Brussels Restaurant. Carte blanche it. You'll know you're going first class, and so will everyone else, too. John Sterling and Mel Allen at Yankee Stadium, some uh, 39 minutes or so uh, before the game, depending on uh, when they started, for television's sake. And uh, Mel, here's a, a buddy of mine from my years in Bollamer, one of the fine uh, sports writers in town, Alan uh, Goldstein. That's why they pronounce it down there. Absolutely, that's why Bollamer. It. Bollamer. Alan Goldstein of uh, the Morning Sun. And first thing I want to ask Alan is... Uh, Reggie Jackson, of course, is uh, helping to broadcast uh, for ABC Television. He played uh, this year in Baltimore. He obviously has played out his option. It's a well-known story. One of the Kansas City uh, coaches before the game, uh, Kidda Jackson, said, have you signed yet? And he said, no, no, I haven't. Obviously, I don't think he's allowed to sign yet. But do you know any more on the Jackson story, where he's going, where he might go? Well, I discussed it in detail with him only a few minutes ago. I was also talking about his new broadcasting career, which he seems to be doing very well at. But he hasn't really uh, given any indication just what he's made his mind up to do. He has an agent handling most of his negotiations, uh, his old college friend uh, down at Arizona State, a fellow named Walker. And he said uh, he's in no hurry to make a decision. All he wants to do is play. What he did say, he said he would limit it to a contending team. He said he's uh, 31 years old now. And he said uh, there's not many years left in his playing career, so he wants to go out a winner. No, I bet he does. Of course, uh, sometimes a team can rise up and become a contender. That may, may mean he wouldn't want to go to the Angels, but he might go to a team. I read that today, Mel. I don't know if uh, he's going to the Angels or not, but may mean he wanted, wants to go to a team that finished 10 or 15 games out. The question is, and I honestly have read it, and I don't really remember the rule, but he only can be approached by the 12 teams from the bottom up. Is that correct or the 12 the 12 worst records would have a shot at him first that's right uh, of course all 12 teams may not decide uh, to bid on reggie uh, figuring uh, uh -huh. that the investment isn't worthwhile but uh, he said there would be some cities he wouldn't even think about playing and i think houston was one of those cities uh, so i think it will get down to maybe four or five teams of course there's a lot of conjecture over whether he'd come to new york and he said he'd like to play for a guy like billy martin and then I also heard him quote of his saying, well, he didn't think he'd wind up here because there's so many good left-handed hitters in the lineup already, and they faced nothing but lefties all year. Well, I, I would tend to think this. If he got enough money, that would be his prime consideration. And uh, playing in a city like New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, within our business, it's considered... They are considered the top three markets. And uh, this is no reflection on Baltimore or Boston or Detroit. Uh, they're fine organizations. Um, but there's so many extras that seem to come to you. And uh, I think the final analysis, uh, uh, he's about, what, 30 years old now? And uh, you would figure him to play maybe four or five more years uh, at most. And if he can get a, a, the, a contract that gives him security with a lot of money, I think that's the team he finally wind up going with. I think that is the, the prime consideration uh, in Reggie's mind. Uh, I don't think uh, he wants to pack his bags every year and head for a new city. I think he is looking for security. But then again, he has uh, the kind of personality where only certain cities fit his lifestyle. I know he likes Oakland. And frankly, I don't think Baltimore quite fitted his lifestyle. Alan, were you uh, surprised, speaking about Baltimore, that that Earl Weaver stayed? You know, the rumors were, of course, rumors. I don't know what rumors mean, but because <laughs> everyone stars him. But but the rumors were that he would be going to the uh, Angels with uh, reunited with Harry Dalton. And I happened to be down in Baltimore a couple of weekends ago to a football game, and I read uh, there was a problem with uh, Weaver and his pitching coach George Bamberger. But they're all coming back. I understand. Well, he did have uh, a little tip with Bamberger. I think it was just uh, something that Weaver said in jest. 
and Bamberger took it seriously, and uh, there was a little uh, ill blood between the two of them, but that's been settled. But as far as whether he would return, this isn't patting myself on the back, but I think I was one of the few riders that said he would come back. And the reason I got that feeling is because they had Hank Peters, the general manager, on a television show about a month ago and asked him about Joe Altabelli, the very uh, capable manager who was down in Rochester. And he seemed to be the heir apparent for the job. In fact, he had told Baltimore that uh, he wouldn't stay at Rochester another year. But when somebody confronted Peters with this, what do you do about Altabelli? He said, uh, well, I think Altabelli should be uh, considered by the two expansion teams. And that seemed to tip his hand that uh, he wasn't coming to Baltimore. I'd like to throw you a quick curve before you wind up here. If the season were to start tomorrow, who would you pick for the pennant? I still think, uh, being an old Yankee fan, I'm biased, of course. I grew up listening to uh, White Owl Wallops and Valentine Beauties. <laughs> but uh, I just think that the Yankees had greater balance than any team uh, in their uh, division. I think the Orioles just didn't have enough hitting. Uh, what about the Red Sox, though? They had the same yes. uh, personnel back said last year. They did. I think one of their problems was I'm, I've never been a big Darrell Johnson fan. I never really thought that uh, he brings out the best in the ball club, and I think that's what happened this year. And uh, they've always had that country club atmosphere up there, and I think they got too many fat cats this year. One more question, Alan, before you leave. Uh, by the way, I would have thought at the beginning of the year Boston as well because on paper, but that's what I meant about going to a contender. Paper doesn't always mean too much. Ask the Pittsburgh Steelers that. Uh, is there any hope, uh, is there a chance that Jackson or Bobby Gritch, the other quality Baltimore player is playing out his option, will return to the Orioles? Will they bid for them? I think there's always a chance, yes. Uh, Hank Peters has been negotiating all season long with uh, Reggie Jackson's agent. And uh, I think they've been very uh, amicable in their negotiations. Now, as far as Gritch goes, uh, he's uh, one of uh, Jerry Capstein's boys, and so is Wayne Garland. And, you know, negotiating with Capstein isn't the easiest thing in the world. But the last time I saw Capstein the other day, he surprisingly said that they were closer to signing Gritch than they were Garland, because I think Garland and Weaver just don't get along. Well, that would be... Uh some uh, trio to lose, a 20-game winner, the best uh, second baseman around, and, and Reggie Jackson, one of the game's great sluggers. That's, that would be pretty tough. Alan, thank you for coming by. Thank you very much. We'll see you in Baltimore soon. Nice to meet you, Alan. Nice to meet you. I'll come down and have some seafood with you, <laughs> some crab cakes. I'd like to uh, call in uh, now, Mel, uh, another uh, member of the uh, Fourth Estate, who I also met in Baltimore, is now the editor with the... Uh, Evening Bulletin in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Jack Chevalier. And Jack, of course, has covered uh, not just this playoff series, but also the Cincinnati-Philadelphia series. And Jack, um, you probably could give us a little more depth on uh, the report that came out of the Phillies yesterday from General Manager Paul Owens that Ozark will stay and Dick Allen will go. Well, that's uh, virtually official, John, and uh, it's nice to be up here with you and tell you a little bit about the National League. The uh, rumors are true. Dick Allen will not be back with the Phillies next year. It was just a, a case with his uh, indifference, it seemed, down the stretch. Here's a man that played for many years in the major leagues, always claimed he wanted to be with a winner, get in the playoffs, the World Series, and uh, when the time came, he kind of isolated himself and, uh, and never took batting practice or fielding practice, kind of stayed in the clubhouse by himself. And... Uh, and then during the games, he was uh, the object of some controversy and fielding plays at first base. And, and late in the games, he was removed for defensive purposes. And then after the games, he was gone. Uh, he would come out of the game in the seventh and eighth innings. And when the uh, rest of the team came in after the final out, he would be gone. He'd be dressed, showered, and, and departed. And the Phillies did announce after the game yesterday that he would not be back. Whereas Ozark, as manager of the year, will be returning. I have a feeling that uh, he just won't be back at all in the major leagues at $250,000. Well, that's a big salary, Mel. That's, uh, that's more than you and Red Barber made put together in your and heyday. I, you're right. And uh, Not in a single year either. <laughs> maybe career, right? But Dick uh, Dick loves to play baseball, he claims, and he, uh, 
he, he got some important hits for the Phillies, although he didn't hit with power like he used to in his earlier days. But I would uh, suspect he'll go to his farm in the sub suburbs of Philadelphia, in Perkesy, Pennsylvania, and take care of his racehorses and, and wait for an offer. And, uh, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that, that he won't play next year. Maybe some team will call him up the 15th of August and say, here's a guy that's uh, available for uh, hitting down the stretch, some contending team. He's not a clubhouse lawyer, is he? Uh, I'm... He's very quiet in a clubhouse. And uh, and uh, the other players, I don't know if it's in defense of him or what, but they uh, they claim that uh, he's a good influence when the when the press isn't around. Now, uh, of course, I'm not there then, so I couldn't tell you how he is with all uh, just the players around, but but uh, he does sulk a little in, uh, in the uh, presence of the press. He never takes practice, uh, infield or batting practice. He claims he doesn't need it after the 1st of July, let's say. And he's, uh, But he certainly hasn't stung the ball with the Dick Allen authority that he used to. Jack, I want to ask you about uh, predictions, because that sounds like my talk show, and I don't know anyone in the world who can predict the uh, final scores of games. And when you play in a short series, anyone can win. Now, having stated all that, do you think any team, whether it's the Phillies or the Royals or the Yankees, measure up to the Reds, who, again, on paper, they just look like a, a team that has everything outside of dominating starting pitching, and if they had that, you wouldn't have to play the game. But uh, Do you think any team measures up to them? No, I think the Phillies uh, come closest to the Reds of any team in the major leagues, and I'm I'm not a native Philadelphian, although I work there, and I'm not a Phillies fan. I just happen to think that player for player, they do measure up closer than any team in baseball. Uh, however, you know, anything can happen. The Yankees have the pitching experience to give the Reds a hard time. Uh, I think Billy Martin would use Ken Holtzman in a World Series. I think he hasn't used him here because he's convinced in his head that right-handers do better against Kansas City. And I think he would consider Holtzman for the first game in a World Series. You know, Holtzman pitched in three World Series, pitched the first game every time, and they won. The Oakland A's won all three World Series. And I think Holtzman would be a candidate for the Saturday's game. And uh, Holtzman and Hunter, I mean, you know, they pitched twice. They could certainly beat anybody. And uh, I think they'd give the Yankees a better chance of beating the uh, Reds and the uh, Kansas City. Well, I think that's why uh, I, I uh, said what I did before, kind of qualifying the question. Uh, even though they don't have as nearly as good a ball club, the best team to face the Reds in the World Series would be the New York Mets because they have great three great starting pitchers. Right. And that's what you what you need in a, a short series. How did that? This is a dumb question, kind of, but Philadelphia has waited so long. 1950 was their last pennant. They finally win the pennant. These playoff series are murdered. Now they're out in three straight. How does Philadelphia, how does the team accept that? Well, the team accepts it uh, better than the city. The team thinks it's a, a learning process. They feel they'll get better next year, and the experience will help them in the playoffs. The city's rather deflated right now, and the, the reception at the airport yesterday was very small, and uh, the, the team, the, the, the city has quickly forgotten that they won their division pretty handily, and uh, I think the city is kind of downhearted. The players have gone on vacation now, and they're convinced it's going to make them a better ball club. I think this year's uh, playoffs will make Kansas City a much better team. Here's a team, as far as Philadelphia is concerned, we never heard of these guys. Wolford, Cowens, Poquette, Jamie Quirk. Who is Jamie Quirk? Right. And, uh, and this team has got to get better, and, and if Oakland A's lose their talent, I think Kansas City could dominate that division yeah. for four or five years. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and I also believe that's true about the learning process. That's Oakland lost their first playoff. They were knocked out in three games, right. and then they learned a little bit, and then they came back and, of course, won three uh, series and three uh, World Series in a row. Jack, we got to run along. I thank you for coming by. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Good luck. Thanks. Jack Chevalier of the uh, of the evening uh, bulletin, Mel. Well, Mel, we, we have to talk among ourselves here. we got to get some some thoughts, some predictions, some first guesses so we don't have to second guess or anything like that. Take care of a couple of commercials, and we'll get back and do a few minutes before the scooter comes in getting ready for his, uh, his broadcast. Yankee Stadium, I, you know, I, if you use it, Mel, it sounds like such a terrible, ponderous, onerous cliche, but but buddy to buddy, man to man, broadcaster to broadcaster, you can feel attention. This is really kind of exciting. I have butterflies in my stomach right now, just as I've always had them. Cool, marvelous night, beautiful stadium, uh, crowd building, uh, the stands are near full, I'd say about 80% full. Uh, the playing field is empty of players. There's a band out in the outfield uh, uh, entertaining the uh, the stadium. 
and pretty soon we'll be uh, we'll be set for a baseball playoff preview being brought to you by Carp Blanche and Emory Air Freight. And we'll get back right after this from Emory Air Freight. Voice recorder on. Oxygen masks on. You're listening to the sound of one of the world's great air forces. Hydraulic systems on and check. An air force with more planes at its disposal than Russia or even America. Ground equipment clear. An air force that flies more often and to more places than any airline in the world. Yet an air force that doesn't have a single plane to its name. It's Emory Air Freight. At Emory, instead of having a fleet of planes at our disposal, we have a fleet of airlines. For we reserve space on key flights of practically every airline carrying freight. And we use hundreds of offline commuter and charter planes where airline service is weak. We also have thousands of people, thousands of trucks, and hundreds of offices waiting for us on the ground. Control, this is 463, ready for takeoff. The next time you have a package to ship, don't just ship it with an air freight company or even a package-only airline. Ship it with an air force. Emory, the shortest distance between two points. Next time you have an appetite for fine French food, go directly to the Four Seasons at 99 East 52nd Street in New York and carte blanche it. The Four Seasons is one of the many great restaurants in New York where your carte blanche card will allow you to spoil, indulge, and treat yourself to the kind of food nobody can make at home. Dinner always tastes a little better when you have it with style with your carte blanche card because people know carte blanche denotes more than an average measure of distinction and taste. With a carte blanche card, you can travel with style, too. You can carte blanche your airline tickets, carte blanche your rented car, carte blanche your hotel bill, even carte blanche a vacation tour through Cartan Tours. Keep your card with you wherever you go and carte blanche your way through over 250,000 doors across the country, including the Four Seasons restaurant. Carte blanche it. You'll know you're going first class and so will everyone else too. We have a few minutes left. I'm going to allow Mel to introduce this gentleman who I met in Baltimore, but of course I met him way before that when I saw him go in the hole and fire runners out with that beautiful throwing arm of his. Mel? I'd like to, uh, you folks to uh, say hello to a fellow by the name of Willie Miranda, who played out here at shortstop when Phil Rizzuto was not uh, able to play on a given day or a given week. But Willie was there. Willie, nobody could cover the ground that you could and had the arm that you did. They always kidded you about your hitting, but every once in a while, you'd tee off of that line drive. Well, Mel, I always want to say hello to all the fans. And to me, it's a great, a great pleasure and an honor to be here tonight and also to see this game that I know the Yankees are going to win, to see you and be able to talk to you after so many years missing. Well, thank you a lot. And uh, John Sterling and I want to know how you as a ball player would felt on an occasion such as this as you're getting ready for the final game that's going to determine the championship of the league or the World Series title. Well, in this type of ball games, the ball players and everybody talking, and it's natural like it's going to have a lot of pressure on it. A real ball players go out and play with a head. No, it's, it's going to be no physic baseball playing tonight if you are really ball players. You got to use your idea, the baseball that you know, and what we say in Spanish, you play with your brains. Because automatically, you know, you're going to run and throw and hit the ball and catch it. But you got to be alert every second because this game counts and there's no other ball game tomorrow. In other words, you don't change up. You go, you play your best and the way you've been playing, they got you here. Right. That's the only way because that's the way you come into this ball game. Well, Willie, we uh, thank you for coming on. We've got to get off the air and make way for your shortstop partner in crime, the scooter, Phil Rizzuto. It's good to see you. You look great. Thank you very you still much. It's nice in... to see you. I still live in Baltimore, but sure. I have an idea to move back to Jersey. Oh, very good. Well, uh, we hope you come back. Thanks a lot, Willie. Okay. Thank you, you, Mel. Willie Miranda. And he uh, he really had some uh, some arm. He had a 100-pound arm on a 140-pound oh, body. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was typical of one of the reasons the Yankees won so often. They had fellows who could step in uh, for the established stars and uh, keep things going. Well, Mel, uh, we're going to be on after the game, and it's either going to be a very happy uh, show or a very sad show. It'll be the end of the season or just the start of something big. This would mean the start of uh, going into the World Series, and we'll have our uh, our uh, playoff previews and post-game program. So 
I'll tell you what, I'll meet you back here on the microphones after the game. We'll find out if we're going to be happy or sad. All right. So we hope you folks will stay tuned in for the ball game, and we'll be talking to you when it's over. Thank you. Playoff preview has been brought to you by Carte Blanche. Since no one credit card is accepted everywhere, you should have Carte Blanche, uh, the credit card you need no matter what other credit cards you have. And by Emory Air Freight, the company that will handle your shipping and freight problems. Call Emory, the shortest distance between two points. Moments from now, Yankee on deck will be coming your way from Yankee Stadium. Dennis Leonard will pitch for Kansas City. Ed Figueroa will go for the Yankees. This is the final game of the uh, championship series. And the winner goes on to the World Series. From Yankee Stadium, this is John Sterling. Now stay tuned for New York Yankee Baseball. Julius drives up court. A lead for Brian. His left side jumper is bullseye. That's the excitement of play-by-play -play sports. And WMCA has more exciting play-by-play -play than anyone else. The New York Yankees, the champion New York Nets, the New York Islanders, Monday Night NFL Football, the NFL Playoffs, the nation's number one college football team, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame, plus New York, New Jersey College Basketball and the National Invitation Tournament. Play by play, day by day, at Real People Radio. WMCA, New York, New York. I'm Sally Jesse Raphael. Here on my show at 1.15 every day, we try to inform, to communicate, and to put a little glamour back into radio. I speak to people who have a broad range of interests, and I hope they speak to me. Join us, won't you? Good this is WMCA, Strong's Communications in New York. Hi, I'm John Sterling, and I've got sports for you. My own talk show, Monday through Friday, 7 to 10, and Saturday afternoons, 1 to 4, plus play-by-play, day-by-day of baseball, basketball, hockey, and football. Deck is being brought to you by Boulevard AMC at 212th and Northern Boulevard. See the brand new AMC cars from Big Al. Hi everybody and welcome to the Yankees on Deck Circle Show. And tonight it's for all the marbles. The whole season rolled up in a one ball game. Whoever wins this plays Cincinnati in the World Series. And our special guest tonight the one and only voice of the New York Yankees, Mel Allen, and we'll be back with Mel right after this. Hi, I'm Sally Jesse Raphael. Every weekday from 1 to 3, I talk to the stars. Why don't you? Together, we'll plug in and watch the sparks fly. Who generates this electricity? Why, you do. Join us, won't you? Earl the Pearl Monroe, Dave Kong Kingman. They're real people and so are you. And you're all invited in. Hi, I'm John Sterling. Here Monday through Friday from 7 to 10 in the evening. Saturday afternoon from 1 to 4. Taking phone calls from real people on WMCA. Real People Radio in New York. All right, as I mentioned, our guest, the voice of the Yankees, Mel Allen, and here's a man who has been in more World Series than even Frank Rossetti. Mel, great to have you back again. I don't think I've been in more than Frank Rossetti, but I appreciate the compliment, Phil. Incidentally, have you heard from Frank? Yes, we see Frank Rossetti whenever we get out to Oakland. He comes up from Stockton. He misses the game as well. You know he would. Well, sure, because uh, he started what around 1932, and uh, he stayed on about a couple of years ago. That's right. Now you're now that you mention it, you're right. He was in more World Series than you. But I learned broadcasting under Mel Allen, and I tell you, Mel, a perfectionist. I never made the same mistake twice. I remember Mel when I first broke in under you. 
I would get mad at first because you would correct me right away, but then later on I found out it was the best thing that ever happened. Well, you know, when I first had the opportunity to uh, get into broadcasting instead of practicing law, I had a chance to come to New York and became an understudy to the greatest broadcaster of all time. He didn't do, he did some baseball, but they didn't do baseball on a daily basis uh, until much later. Uh, but that was Ted Husey, oh, and he point. was a real perfectionist, and he did the same thing. And so knowing that he was the greatest, I just sort of followed his guidelines. I think most people uh, have done that since. And it wasn't a case of enjoying telling somebody something. After all, one never gets too old to make a mistake. One never gets too old to learn. In fact, I learned things from you. And... Um, whomever I was working with. But if it was something, especially, you know, when one starts out uh -huh. uh, that you felt you could help somebody with, uh, you would tell them because we worked together as a team. I remember when you started out here in 1941. Frank Rossetti was shortstop, speaking of Frank. And I remember Joe McCarthy gradually eased you in. That's right. Even though he knew you were going to be the shortstop, pros at the end of his career. But he didn't just throw you in there like that. He'd uh, play you like maybe like every three or four days, sit on the bench next to him, point out certain things, and he gradually worked you in until you became the regular That's guy. That's right. Not only did McCarthy point out certain things, but Crescetti was such a nice human being. He would show me where to play all the hitters, which I had never seen before. Well, that's what you call class. I remember Joe DiMaggio, for example, in the World Series in 1950. You played in it against the Whiz Kids. And Granny Hamner made an error. And remember, the first three games were decided all by one Very run. Close, right. And so Joe, who had been on first, managed to reach second base as a, as a result of the error. As he was leading off, though, he leaned, he turned over his shoulder and he said something to Hamner. I didn't know what it was. After the game, I found out. You know what he said? Wow. He said, don't let it bother you, Granny. He said, it happens to the best of us. And this is the middle of a World Series. Now, that's class. That is class. We're going to be back with Mel Allen. But first, this is probably the most exciting time of the year, the playoffs on. The World Series coming up and the new cars for 77 are out. And no one has a bigger selection of better deals on all the new 77s than Big Al Saleo, a Boulevard AMC Jeep. He's got the roomy wide-angle Pacer wagons, the power-packed AMX, and the all-new economical little Gremlin. Plus Hornets, Matadors, and all the other AMC Jeep All-Stars for 1977. On top of his already low prices and generous trade-in allowances, Big Al has the Cruncher, AMC's exclusive buyer protection plan, which now includes a second-year guarantee on the powertrain. So visit Boulevard AMC Jeep at 21219 Northern Boulevard in Bayside, Queens, between the Clearview and Cross Island Expressways. That's 21219 Northern Boulevard, Bayside, or call Big Al at 423-7700 and find out what the excitement is all about. And speaking of excitement, we have it here tonight, Mel Allen. Yes, it, it, it uh, is my first experience with a final game of a divisional playoff, but it's just like the seventh game of a World Series. Absolutely. You've been in so many of them. I know that uh, it's always a thrill, and uh, everybody would listen to you. And I think one of your greatest attributes was your ability to uh, fill in in a rain delay. I have heard you go for an hour, an hour and a half. I had to. I couldn't find you. You <laughs> don't weigh on me. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time you left me alone in spring training in St. Petersburg when the Yankees were training there. And there was a rain delay of about 12 minutes, and I'd say I was never so scared in my life. But now, uh, you know, in the years uh, that have uh, gone by since... I'm sure you find it uh, a great deal different because even on, you know, on television, they turn the camera on you. There's so many things that have happened. You just uh, talk to the people. No, it you're absolutely. It becomes a lot easier. It than does, you do. but that first time is always something that it's just like your first game in the big leagues. How about your first game as a broadcaster now, coming up from Alabama? Well, it was the same way. I, I, I didn't know what to do when I always felt that. A three-second lag, and there was three hours, you uh -huh. know, and, and it would worry you. But it's just like playing ball. Once you get used to the mechanics, and they become secondary, then you go ahead and you execute to the extent of the ability that made the team hire you in the first place. Well, I remember you saying that, and that was one of the real pluses that helped me 
when you said, and at the beginning, I was ahead of all the, I was anticipating too much what was going to happen on the field. And I remember you saying, now look, just do the ball game. When you're on TV, follow the monitor, you will get in trouble. Right. You. Well, you can tell the Yankees are being introduced right now by the roar. I want to let that roar come out instead of answering your question. Well, but, that's the showman in you. You do it just right. Your timing has always been perfect. Well, it could be the last time they have to give the Yankees the ovation that they still are giving them for a fantastic season. And let us hope that they get into the World Series. I'm with you 100%. And tonight's gift for our on-deck circle guest, Mel Allen, is a daisy foot bath from Two Guys Discount Department Store. Two Guys is the only place where you'll find the widest selection of top quality name brand goods for you, your home, car, and leisure time activities, all at everyday low discount prices. After the game, it's Two Guys, naturally. Now stay tuned for New York Yankee baseball. Since the beginning of time, people have laughed at great ideas. Those right boys claim they've invented a flying machine. <laughs> Telephone. Alan Bender, who are you going to call? <laughs> Electric light? Hey, Edison, get a candle. <laughs> they also laughed in 1921 when White Castle unveiled the little square hamburger. Then they tasted its pure American beef and savory chopped onions. And another funny little idea made history. The White Castle Hamburger. Without it, all hamburgers would be the same. All 29 White Castle locations in the New York, New Jersey area are open 24 hours a day. Locations at Queens Boulevard and 43rd Street in Sunnyside, Sunrise Highway and Broadway in Lynbrook, Northern Boulevard and Bell and Bayside, and at Union Turnpike and Parsons Boulevard in Flushing. Y A N K B E N. Here come the Yankees. Let's get behind the cheer the Yankees. They're gonna learn to feel the Yankees. Everyone knows they play the win. Cause they're from New York Yankees. Hello everyone and welcome to New York Yankee Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Schaefer Beer. Go out and get a Schaefer and see Schaefer people do. By Gabriel. No matter what you drive, no matter how you drive, there's a Gabriel shock for you. Gabriel, king of the road. By Household Finance. A company that says never borrow money needlessly. Household Finance. By Chrysler Plymouth. It's the year to say yes to Motor Trend's car of the year, Chrysler Plymouth Volari. By Getty Premium and new Getty Unleaded Regular. The higher octane gasoline with the lower prices. Buy the people from Colonial Yankee Franks. The all beef franks with a taste that takes you out to the ball game. And by Lincoln Savings Bank, the bank who makes friends for life. The Lincoln Savings Bank in Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Manhattan. Hi, everybody, and welcome to New York Yankee Baseball. On the field below, right now, the Kansas City Royals being introduced. And the Yankee fans booing them as loudly as they can. And you'll be able to tell when the Yankees are being introduced because you'll hear nothing but cheers. So let's get everything out of the way in time for the ball game. A reminder that this program is authorized by the New York Yankee Baseball Club. Underwrites purchased by Manchester Broadcasting Productions Incorporated solely for the entertainment of our audience. Any broadcast, rebroadcast, or other use of this game without the express written consent of the Yankees and Manchester Broadcasting is prohibited. New York Yankee Baseball is a production of Manchester Broadcasting Productions Incorporated, which has contracted for and has exclusive rights to the broadcasting of these games, including selection of the announcers, with the approval of the Yankees and this station. All right, this is it. The whole season coming down to just one ball game, and every mistake will be magnified, and every great play will be uh, magnified. And it's a tough night for the players, I tell you. I know last night, 
being in the same situation many times with the great Yankee teams of the past. You stay awake and you dream and you think what might be if you're the hero or the goat. And it's really a tremendous amount of pressure on all the ball players and, of course, the manager, Billy Martin and Whitey Herzog. We'll give you the starting lineups for the Kansas City Royals leading off in center field, Al Collins. Remember, the Royals have been without their star center field of Amos Otis since the first inning of the first game out in Kansas City when he sprained his ankle. Tom Poquette will be in right field and bat second. At third base and batting third, George Brett. Big John Mayberry hitting in the cleanup spot at first base. In left field and batting fifth, Hal McRae. Jamie Quirk, again the designated hitter. He did a fine job yesterday. He'll be batting in the sixth position. Cookie Rojas, who had a fine game at second base, will be a, again at second base batting seventh. The shortstop batting eighth, Freddie Patek. And catching and batting ninth, Buck Martinez. On the mound for Kansas City, Dennis Leonard. For the New York Yankees, leading off in center field, Mickey Rivers. And Mickey, who has admitted himself he has had a very disappointing playoff so far, hoping for a big game tonight. The Yankees really need it. They need Mickey on base. Roy White will be in left field and bat second. Catching and batting third, Thurman Munson. At first base, hitting in the cleanup spot, Chris Chambliss. Carlos May will be the designated hitter, batting fifth. At third base and batting six, Greg Nettles, and he has had an outstanding playoff series so far. Oscar Gamble will be in right field, batting seventh. At second base, batting eighth, Willie Randolph. And the shortstop, batting ninth, Fred Stanley. Pitching for the New York Yankees, Ed Figueroa. And they have just finished introducing the Kansas City Royals. And momentarily, you'll hear the roar come up as starting right now. These Yankee fans have waited over 12 years for this moment. And Billy Martin being introduced. Billy walks over, shakes hands with Whitey Herzog. Mickey Rivers, who shakes hands with Billy Martin. This is really an exciting night. Can you just imagine everything that's on the line for both these ball clubs? One will be a winner and go on to play Cincinnati. The other will be a loser and have to go home and reminisce about the whole season. Roy White has just been introduced. And now it'll be a big hand for Thurman Munson, an outstanding candidate for most valuable player. And this next man coming up has had a great year. He, along with Thurman, have gotten so many clutch base hits to win ball games for the Yankees. Chris Shambliss. That's it. I have never seen the Yankees quite so excited and up as they are tonight. They are ready for this ball game, and both teams are going to have to go out and give 1,000%. Here's Carlos May. Came over from the White Sox, and was so important a cog in the Yankee wheel for winning. He goes down the line shaking hands with everybody. Billy Martin patting them all on the back. Streamers flowing from out the upper deck. Balloons going. It's like Mardi Gras night here as Greg Nettles comes out on what a day he had yesterday. Two home runs. One of the greatest plays we've seen all year. Playing with a severely bruised right foot. And 
And now Oscar Gamble. Oscar goes down the line shaking hands. I tell you, this has got to shake the Royals up a little bit to see this Yankee club come out and exhibit so much spirit. As a rule, the Yankees have been very nonchalant, realizing they had the pennant won a long time ago, the divisional title. There's Willie Randolph, the sensational young rookie. And now a young man, you have been overlooked by so many, but what a year he's had for the Yankees. He plugged the shortstop hole, Fred Stanley. And now the young man from Puerto Rico being introduced, loosening up in the bullpen, Ed Figueroa. There'll be a lot of people going home horse tonight. Especially if there are a lot of base hits and great plays. They'll be yelling from the first pitch. And Bob Shepard. Hoping this is not the last time he'll have to ask the people to rise. As everybody lines up facing the flag.
Say, Frank, do you mind doing the play-by-play for a while? I want to concentrate on my Butterfingers bite by bite. Well, you know, Phil, Butterfingers are the candy bars so good, you got to earn them. Well, that's no problem. It so happens Phil Rizzuto is a household word. Hmm. Well, it is in my household, and my mother considers me to be quite semi-famous. Well, that may be good enough for one or two Butterfingers, but you've got a whole fun-sized bag. You haven't earned all those Butterfingers. So what should I do with the rest of them? Well, it so happens Frank Messer is a household word. Here's his man, America shops for the kids we give. It's still not too late to enjoy the early shopper's discount of $5 on purchases totaling $50 or more from Sears' new Christmas wish book. But hurry, shop by phone from home or see a wish book at Sears' catalog order desk. The early shopper's discount from Sears' Christmas wish book. Sears, where America shops. Game time, 54 degrees, and I believe it went up a couple of degrees. It was a lot colder than that about two hours ago. And a jam-packed crowd. I'll give you the umpires. Art Franz will be calling balls and strikes. Larry McCoy at first. Joe Brinkman at second. Larry Barnett at third. George Maloney down the left field line. And Bill Haller down the right field line. As both bullpen crews are walking across center field out to their respective bullpens which is situated out almost in dead center field and left center field and Gamble and Munson playing a little catch and the first ball tonight is going to be thrown out by the Yankee clubhouse man Pete Sheehy who has spent more time here at Yankee Stadium than any other man alive or who has passed away for that matter Pete Sheehy came in the early 20s or maybe the middle 20s the early 20s and has been here ever since he has uh, seen more great ball players come and go than any other person I guess in baseball the great years of murderers row for the Yankees that was 1927 and Pete still in great shape He's a fixture around here. The Yankee ball players wouldn't know what to do without P.G. Yankees ready now as they stand down on the bottom of their dugout steps waiting to charge out on the field. The Yankees are looking for their 30th pennant and the first since 1964. And I tell you, if the Yankees win, this ballpark will be decorated with pennants that no other club has as many of. That'll be all around this ballpark. All right, Figueroa is just now getting uh, to the Yankee dugout as he uh, finishes warm-ups out in center field. And the Yankees will wait till he's about ready and then charge out on the field. By the way, this is Ed Figueroa's birthday. The Yankees take the field, led by Greg Nettles out to third base. It'll be Nettles at third, Stanley at short, Randolph at second, Chambliss at first, White and left, Rivers in center, Gamble in right, Munson catching, and Ed Figueroa out on the mound. Figueroa, 28 years old today. The Yankees' leading winner in 1976, winning 19 and losing 10. And now, P.G. standing in the on-deck circle. He better make a good throw to Munson or the ball players will really get all over him. And here's Pete with the wind-up, and he throws a strike to Munson, who will go over and flips it back to Pete. And now Figueroa will take his warm-up pitches, and we'll be ready to go. A lot of people can fantasize, just think of themselves being out there in the position of these Yankee and Royal ball players, how much this ball game means to each one. Not only the difference in money for each player, but the prestige of getting into a World Series and trying to cool off those cocky Cincinnati Reds who have really been popping off. I know the Yankees would love to get a shot at them, so would Kansas City. And 
right now, while Figueroa is loosening up, we'll pause for station identification on the New York Yankee home of Champions Radio Network. WMCA, Strauss Communications in New York. This is Mel Allen. Don't ship a package with an air freight company. Ship it with an air freight system. Emory, the shortest distance between two points. All right, a big hubbub in right and back of the Yankee dugout, dead center, Telly Savalas. We might have to ask him to put a hat on his head. It's shining up here, some glare. But that's the thing lately. They say being bald is very sexy. All right. I'll tell you, just about everybody you want to name be here. And I carry Grant hasn't missed a game here at Yankee Stadium in the playoffs. Frank Sinatra's been here. And we're ready for the first pitch of the ball game as Al Collins will step in. Collins, so far in the series, has three hits and 17 at bats, one triple. No runs batted in, and he scored twice. He's a good man to keep off the base path, though. He has two stolen bases. The Royals have four stolen bases. Collins has two. Wolf for the other two. And yet the man who leads him in stolen bases has been thrown out every time he's tried to steal Freddie Patek. All right, building up to the first pitch of the ball game. Collins deep in the box. Figueroa gets the sign from Munson. Here's the first pitch, and it's low and outside ball one as Collins bluffed a bunt. Yankee outfield straight away. Collins a right-hand batter. Figueroa's next pitch. Strike one call, one on one. Collins a big fella, 6'2", 200 pounds from Los Angeles. Check swing and it's down low. Munson wants to know if he swung and the first base umpire, Larry McCoy, said no, he did not swing. Munson thought he had swung and is arguing with Art France, but France asked the first base umpire and he shook his head no, he did not go around. All right, it's two balls and a strike. We told you every pitch is so important here. Figueroa swings into the windup. And a bouncer off home plate, and Randolph's going to have to hurry. He gets it through. They got him. Pretty play by Willie Randolph. And that's one of the toughest plays for any infielder. A Baltimore chop off home plate. Went about 30 feet in the air. Willie had to get it on the first short hop and get rid of it in the same motion and did. That youngster is Mr. Cool out there. We got to give him a big star on the first play of the ball game. Willie Randolph. Just a rookie, but plays like he's been to the big leagues 10 years. Here is Tom Poquette. Poquette batting 231 for the playoffs, three for 13, but he has two doubles and four runs batted in. Left hand batter bounces it foul outside of first strike one. Chuck Hiller is the coach at third base and uh, Steve Boros at first base for Whitey Herzog's Kansas City Royals. The next pitch is fouled just below it. And one of the nets out in the luxury boxes gets a souvenir. Poquette is 5'11", 175 pounds from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Again, the Yankee outfield straight away. One out, nobody on. Two strikes to count on Poquette. Figueroa winds. And the pitch just missed the outside corner. Man, that was close to take. On deck is George Brett. One ball, two strikes. Here's the pitch. He jammed him and he fouled it. Just got a piece of it. Fouled it down the third baseline. Good pitch by Figueroa. Poquette had a fine year batting 302 in the regular season, but he was injured. Severely injured running into a wall. 
which cut down his chances for being possibly the rookie of the year. All right, it's still a ball and two strikes. One out, nobody on. Figueroa kicks. His pitch curve a little bit high as Poquette started to off right. It held up. And it's even at two and two. Figueroa normally gets that breaking pitch down around the knees. That one was up just above the letters. The 2-2 pitch. A foul. Can you imagine all year we've been waiting for a foul ball? I finally get one two inches away. And Leib Friedman gets his plumber's hands in the way he thought he had a wrench. There's a swing and a miss, strike three. And Figueroa gets a big strikeout in the ball game. There are two out. And the batter now, George Brett. Brett batting 4.29 in the playoffs, six for 14. He scored twice, has one triple and two runs batted in. And, of course, over the regular season, Brett led the American League in batting with a 333 average, 215 hits. Two out, nobody on. The pitch is outside ball one. Brett is six feet tall, 200 pounds, from Blue Springs, Missouri. A foul back in the crowd, not a play. Evens the count at one and one. No way the butterflies are not floating around in the ball players tonight or with the crowd. Rivers shades Brett slightly over to left center field now. And the one one pitch down low with a breaking pitch two and one. Right over near the line and left. Rivers not playing quite as shallow here at the stadium as he did out in Kansas City. Brett did hit a line drive over Mickey's head. Mickey misjudged it slightly, and it opened the gates for a big inning for the Royals. The 2-1 pitch, foul off the umpire's chest protector, bounces all the way back to the mound. Art Franz out to look at it. And he keeps it in play. The count is even at 2-2. Two and two. On deck, big John Mayberry. Figueroa appearing very cool, calm, and collected out on the mound. Now he winds. And the pitch outside is three and two. He tried to put a little extra on a fastball dipping away from Brett. But missed the corner. Brett has had two walks in the series. Struck out just once. Now the payoff pitch. Line, base hit to right field. Might be extra bases. Gamble left. It will be a double as Oscar comes up with the ball off the wall and Brett continues his hot hitting. A double to right field as the Yankees were playing him to hit straight away. He pulled the ball. And for Brett, that's his seventh hit of the series, his first double of the series. And it brings up John Mayberry. And these Royals have been rough with two out in this series. Mayberry just missed a grand slam homer in yesterday's ball game. He is two for 14 in this series. No extra base hits and one run batted in. They'll be very careful with Mr. Mayberry. The pitch is fouled out of play down the left field line back into the crowd. Nettles and uh, Stanley chase it down the line until it goes into the seats. Two men are out as Brett goes back to second base. Now the Yankees are deep and swung around towards right with Mayberry up there. No score. Top of the first. Two out. Figueroa kicks. Delivers. It's high and away. One and one. On deck, Hal McRae. I'm going to see which stance McRae is going to use tonight. I believe he'll go to that straight up stance. He had gone 0 for 10, crouching, and then stood up and hit three bullets. Two of them for base hits. One, Nettles made a great play. 1-1 pitch. High drive to right. I don't know whether it'll be far enough. 
Gamble back to the wall. Leaps. Home run. He can't get it. A towering home run just over the wall. And John Mayberry has put the Royals out in front two to nothing. And again, after two are out, these Royals have been tough. He got a curveball up to him, and Mayberry gets his first extra base hit of the playoffs. Just out of the reach of Oscar Gamble, who went back against the wall, leap tie, just barely cleared the fence. But that's all you have to do, and the Royals are out in front two to nothing. And all this after two out, McRae takes a pitch down low, ball one. McRae is standing straight up. Figueroa delivers. It's in there. Strike called. One on one. The crowd noticeably silent now. That was the first home run hit by the Royals in this playoff. McRae is two for 13. A double, a triple, and one run batted in. And a foul back and out of play in the upper deck. I tell you. That was a towering home run, and you really had to wait. Couldn't tell by the way Gamble played it whether it was going to be deep enough. Two to nothing, the Royals lead. And the curve swing and a missed strike three. He gets the tough McRae. Two strikeouts on the inning, but two runs on two hits. No errors, nobody left. In the middle of the first, the Royals two and the Yankees coming to bat. Get yourself up, go on Zark. You're a hard man to beat. You've got wings on your feet. Get yourself up, go on Zark. You're gonna win every time. With a going, growing airline. Get yourself up, go on Zark. If you're a businessman who's going... On the mound for the Royals, Dennis Leonard. Leonard has appeared in one ball game. He worked two and a third innings, giving up six hits and three runs, all of them earned. He has had a fine year in the regular season. And a New York boy, by the way. He lives in Sarasota, Florida now, but he's uh, a New Yorker. And his family comes to watch him pitch whenever he's on the mound, whether it's here, Kansas City, California, wherever. So he'll be working to Mickey Rivers, Roy White, and Thurman Munson. Here in the bottom of the first inning, the Yankees trailing two to nothing on a two-run homer by John Maber. Mickey Rivers in this series is 4 for 18. No extra base hits. No runs batted in. He has walked once, struck out once, and has scored just twice. He does not have a stolen base. He tried one stolen base and was caught stealing. And the Yankees need Mickey on the bases if they're going to win. Buck Martinez fires the ball down to second baseman Cookie Rojas and Rivers coming up ready to lead off. Dennis Leonard is 6'1", 190 pounds. Mickey batted 312 during the regular season. George Brett moves in at third. By the way, Mac Ray is in right field and Poquette in left field. As the pitch to Rivers is fouled back and out of play. One strike on Mickey Rivers. Leonard Wines and the curve is just outside one and one. One pitch, a curve, a hit deep to left field. Pokehead going back. He's not going to get it. It's over his head, off the wall. Rivers around second. He's going to go into third. And the throw, not in time. Rivers in with a triple. Holy cow, did he hit that one. 
Poquette was playing him shallow in left field. Mickey Bellard won one hop against the wall, and nobody else would have gotten a triple on the ball hit like that except Mickey Rivers. So Mick gets the Yankees off and winging. And Rivers said he was going to have his best night tonight. He's already done that. The batter now, Roy White. Listen to this crowd. Roy White batting at 267 is four for 15. Three doubles and two runs batted in. And the Royals will play the infield back and give up a run. Rivers leads off third. The stretch by Leonard. The pitch to White. A bouncing ball in the hole. Backhanded by Patek. The long throw is low. White beats it out. And infield hit. Rivers scores and it's two to one. Patek went deep to the outfield grass. Threw a one hop at a Mayberry. But Roy White with a burst of speed beat it out. And a run batted in for White. Rivers scores. It's now the Royals two and the Yankees one. Nobody out and Roy White down at first base in the bat of Thurman Munson. Thurman Munson batting 389 in the playoffs. Seven for 18. Two doubles, one run batted in. And now, Galen Sisko, the pitching coach, is coming out. And looking out towards the bullpen. Looks like Paul split off the left-hander out in the bullpen. Normally, Whitey Herzog comes out to make the pitching changes. We double check out in the bullpen. And it looks like split off. And Bill Kane's going to check it for me. It is Paul split off the big left-hander. And it doesn't look like they're going to take Dennis Leonard out. At least not right now. Maybe another base hit. Leonard was the pitcher who started the ball game. That split off came on and did such a great job in relief that the Royals won out in Kansas City. Nobody out. Roy White at first base. Thurman Munson, the bat of the Royals, leading two to one here in the bottom of the first inning. All right, Mayberry holds the bag against White. There's a throw over there, but Roy back easily. Timeout as a green balloon rolls across home plate. Leonard comes to the belt. Pitch to Munson. Down low ball one. The Yankees have had only two stolen bases in the playoffs. And Chris Chambliss has one, believe it or not. And Willie Randolph the other one. On deck is Chambliss. White leads off first. Leonard, who takes a lot of time, now comes set. There goes White. Swing and a miss to throw to second. White has a stolen base. Martinez could not get the ball out of his glove. The Yankees had the hit and run on. And Martinez could not get the ball out of his glove. So White gets a stolen base. And the Yankees have something going again here in the bottom of the first. White at second. Nobody out. A 1-1 count on Munson. Thurman trying to hit that ball to right field. So a big break for the Yankees there as Martinez double pump trying to get that ball out of his glove. Royals two, Yankees one, bottom of the first. Listen to this crowd. White leads off second. Pitch to Munson. Swing and a foul off the shin guards of the catcher. It's one ball, two strikes. Thurman again trying to shoot to right field. And now Martinez goes out to have a chat with Leonard. Pats him on the backside and comes back. All right, 
by Therm, a good two-strike hitter. He really guards that plate. Leonard's throwing very hard tonight. He knows he goes as long as he can. They got a lot of other pitches in the bullpen. All right, the right-hander comes to the belt. And the pitch to Munson. Foul upstairs and out of play. Good fastball that Therm was trying to slice to right. Just got under it. Still a ball and two strikes on Munson. Stream is flying all over the backstop on top of it. And the volume builds up again as Leonard checks Roy White. Delivers to Munson, a curve, bounce in the whole base hit left field. Roy White going to have to stop at third base. And Munson's going to go to second. He's going to make it. Good heads up base running by Munson as Mayberry cut off the throw. Dick Hauser held White up. And Munson comes through with a clutch single to left field. Here comes Whitey Herzog. That's all for Dennis Leonard. The Yankees did not let the two-run homer by John Mayberry phased them one bit. They have bounced back with a run. Have runners at second and third. Nobody out. Chambliss the batter. And Paul Splithoff is being waved in from the bullpen. And here comes the new pitcher making his way to the mound. Here's his it's still not too late to enjoy the early shopper's discount of $5 on purchases totaling $50 or more from Sears' new Christmas wish book. But hurry, shop by phone from home or see a wish book at Sears' catalog order desk. The early shopper's discount from Sears' Christmas wish book. Sears, Is there something you want that would make your life a whole lot easier, more enjoyable? An HFC shopper's loan could be the best way to get it. Come on in and ask about a shopper's loan. Household finance, an equal opportunity lender. So come on in, come on in, come on in, tell HFC. Household finance, where people use our money to get the most out of life. Come on in to HFC. Paul Splitoff has come on to do the pitching now. It's been a rough playoffs for young Dennis Leonard. He's been knocked out twice now here in the first inning without retiring a Yankee. Rivers tripled. White single to drive him in, then stole a base. Munson single to left. The Yankees have runners at second, third, and Splitoff is coming on. What a job he did against the Yankees. He worked five and two-third innings, allowing four hits and no runs. He walked two and struck out one. Splitoff considers himself a very, very lucky young man. He had hurt the pitching finger on his left hand, was sent down uh, to Florida to recuperate and pitch a little bit, then was called back, never had an idea they were going to use him in the playoffs, and when they called on him, he was ready. But tonight's a different night. Yankee fans standing. They trailed 2-1, to one, but they have... Munson at second, White at third, and Chris Chambliss the batter. By the way, Munson picked up his eighth hit of the playoffs that ties Chambliss and also ties Matty Alou's record for the most hits in a playoff by American League ball player. It's, the record is held by Pete Rose, who has nine hits. So now two Yankees have a chance to tie that or break it. Chambliss and Munson. White leads off third. Munson off second. Here's the stretch by split off. Pitch to Chambliss, high, almost a wild pitch, ball one. You know, it's a lot different coming in to pitch a ball game when your team is leading than when your team is behind. Some pitchers pitch a lot better with the team behind than when they're ahead. A curve, hit to left field, that should get a run in. Roy White tagging at third. Poquette makes the catch, the throw to the plate. And not nearly in time. White scores. Munson holds it second. We're all tied up at 2-2. A sacrifice fly. A run batted in for Chris Chambliss. And the ball game is tied up. 
Now there is one out. And the battle will be Carlos May. Carlos May is two for six in the playoffs with one double, no runs batted in. And they are trying to wave McRae in and over in right field. Remember, McRae has not played too much outfield. He's been the designated hitter most of the year. All right, Munson at second, one out. We're all tied 2-2 two -two in the bottom of the first. Here's the stretch by split off. And the curve is over, strike one call. Poquette showed me a pretty good arm there, though it was way offline. On deck, Greg Nettles. One man out. Split off to the belt. Curve swing and a miss. Off speed breaking pitch and Carlos way out in front. For Chambliss, that was his sixth run batted into the playoffs. And that leaves the Yankees. Matter of fact, it leaves both clubs in runs batted in. All right, nothing in two on Carlos May. Munson leading off second. Split off kicks. A foul back and out of play over the Royals dugout and into the crowd. I'm telling you, the Yankees showed me something bouncing back. A lot of teams could have collapsed after that towering two-run homer by John Mayberry. But that's the kind of club the Yankees and the Royals have been all year. Bounce back from adversity. Don't let anything get you down. That's why they're fighting for the championship here tonight. Again, the 0-2 pitch foul back and out of play. Still nothing in two on Carlos. Big left hand of Paul Splithoff. He's 6'3", 210 pounds from Blue Springs, Missouri. Change up, looped in the shallow left center, but coming on is Cowens. He's there now, and one hands it. Carlos did not hit that ball well. It looked like it might drop in for a moment. Two out, and now Greg Nettles. Nettles has come on strong in the playoffs. He's four for 14. One double, two homers. And four runs batted in. He got both those homers in yesterday's ball game. One a two-run shot and one a solo homer. So two men are out. Munson at second. We're all tied 2-2. Pitch to Nettles. High and tight ball one. On deck, Oscar Gamble. The Royals have two hits. The Yankees three. Split off gets the sign from Martinez. Checks Munson and delivers to the plate. And a throw to second base and Munson jumps back in time. Good throw by Martinez. It's two and nothing to Nettles. Now wait a minute, Nettles comes back. I don't know whether France called that a strike or not. The scoreboard says two and oh. We'll find out in a moment. Let off stretches. And the pitch foul back on the screen. He came in with a fastball to Nettles. And again, Martinez runs out to the mound. We'll pause for station identification on the New York Yankee Home of Champions Radio Network. WMCA, Strauss Communications in New York. This is Mel Allen. Instead of having a fleet of planes... Emory has a fleet of airlines. Emory Air Freight, the shortest distance between two points. All right, split off, ready again. Delivers, a curve popped up, shallow left, Brett going back. It's in fair territory, Patek there. Patek calls him off and a little shortstop makes the play in fair territory. But the Yankees pick up two runs on three hits, no errors, a man left. 
At the end of one, it's the Royals two and the Yankees two. I want a beer like no other beer. I'm staying for people. I want flavor that won't disappear. I'm shaped for people. Consistency makes a great beer. And Schaefer is consistently great tasting every single time. Hey, Figueroa back on the mound in a brand new ball game. And I got a feeling this thing's going to go right down to the wire. That kind of a night. Both ball teams playing aggressive baseball. And see who gets the breaks in the ball game. That'll determine the winner. Usually does in uh, playoffs and World Series play. Tell you, there's a great article in TV Guide. I hardly ever read it, but this article was about ball players who get jitters in the World Series and playoff game. Excellent article. It takes a different viewpoint trying to get inside a player to see why some of the superstars don't have good playoffs and good World Series. The tremendous pressure on each ball player. And what happens? An article in there, what happens to your blood when you get nervous and excited? All right, Jamie Quirk, the batter. And he lines one foul down the right field seats. Man, he got around on a slider. Quirk is swinging that bat with some authority. He is one for three. That hit a triple and two runs batted in. He was used as the designated hitter yesterday, and it paid off for Whitey Herzog and the Royals. A left-hand batter. Figueroa's next pitch. Foul down the left field line and out of play. It's 0-2. Quirk is six feet four inches tall, 185 pounds, from Whittier, California. And during the regular season, Quirk batted 246. The pitch held up, and it's just a little bit high, a ball and two strikes. We're all tied two apiece here in the top of the second. Figueroa gets the sign from Munson. His pitch inside, and it's two and two. And Figueroa is really bearing down on each pitch. Unlike the way he pitches during the regular season, he'll ease up every once in a while. But nobody can ease up tonight. Give it all you got. Nobody out, nobody on. The 2 2 delivery foul to our left and out of play. Still two and two on Quirk. On deck, Cookie Rojas. The 2 2 pitch. Line to left field, but Roy White moving to his right is there and makes the catch. One away, old reliable out in left field, Roy White. Reminds me of Tommy Hendrick. They don't get the ink, they don't get the publicity, but day in, day out, they do an outstanding job. Here's Cookie Rojas. Cookie made his first start in yesterday's ball game. He's two for five with one run batted in. Frank White had started the three previous games for the Royals. And the pitch to Cookie is right in there, strike one call. Cookie's a tough man to play. Hits to all fields. On deck, Freddie Patek. Slider is high, and it's one and one. We'll see a lot of activity in the stands throughout the night. Tempers get the best of some of the fans. Their loyalty and rooting. And occasionally a little wager on a game. Full house. Oh, I tell you. The last three games has been beautiful seeing this park packed. The 1 1 pitch. Base hit. High fastball. He drills out in the center field. Mickey Rivers up with it, and Rojas makes the turn and holds on. So Figueroa's got to keep that ball down, as we mentioned. That's the third hit. For the Royals, each team with three base hits, and here's Freddie Pottek. 
Pontek batting 429. He's six for 14. Two doubles and four runs batted in. And the Yankees have to be alert for possible bunt, hit, and run. Cookie Rojas, smart base runner, doesn't have the speed he used to have, but can still steal a base when needed. Figueroa to the belt. The pitch to Pontek. High ball one. Pontek is the littlest ball player in the major leagues. Five feet, four inches tall, 140 pounds. And when he crouches, there's not much of a target to shoot at, though he doesn't get many walks. A 1-0 pitcher, curve in there, one one On deck, Buck Martinez, the catcher. A ball, a strike, one out. Rojas leads off first. We're all tied 2-2. Fastball over the outside corner. One ball, two strikes. Figueroa taking plenty of time out on the mound. He checks Rojas at first. And the pitch a little bit high, and the count is even at two and two. Freddy Patek has hit safely in each of the first four games. And Rojas going to throw to first. They're going to have to hurry, and they get him. No, he's safe. Figueroa, instead of stepping off the mound, wheeled and threw to Chambliss, who threw to Randolph. And Rojas beat the return throw to second base. That'll have to go as a stolen base. Rojas jumped off the bag while Figueroa was looking at him. And Figueroa got a little ruffled. Instead of stepping off the mound and throwing to second, he wheeled and threw to first. By that time, Rojas was halfway to second. And though Chambliss made a good throw, Rojas, with a slide, beat the tag. So that's a stolen base. Pitch to Patek. Swing and a miss. Strike three. Big strikeout for Figueroa. That's his third strikeout of the ball game. And now Bob Lemon, who is coming out and talking with Figueroa. I'm going to tell him how to pitch to Martinez. Remember, at one time, Bob Lemon managed this Kansas City Royal team. A lot of pitchers can get upset with a play like that. You see the runner going, and even though the best play is to step off the mound, your instincts tell you to wheel and throw to first base, which is exactly what Figueroa did on that play. Two men are out. Figueroa now with three strikeouts. Two to the score, top of the second. The kick. And the pitch swing and a miss, strike one. On deck, Al Collins. And Billy Martin now telling everybody there are two out. Figueroa kicks. His pitch line, base hit, right field. Gamble coming in, bounces off his hip. No chance going to second base is Martinez. Rivers throw. And he's safe at second base. And the Royals go out in front, three to two. Well, there the Royals took advantage of a misplay by Figueroa to get Rojas to second. It's a single for Martinez, a run batted in. Gamble is charged with the error as the ball bounced off his knee. Rojas scores, and the Royals once again go out in front. It is now Royals three and the Yankees two. So the Royals took advantage of a big break. Martinez is at second with two out in the batter, Al Collins, who was thrown out on a fine play by Willie Randolph. First time up. Figueroa delivers. It's high ball one. Looks like Grant Jackson up in the Yankee bullpen. Martinez leads off second. Curve is over the outside corner. It's one and one. K 
pity. These Royals have been murder after two are out. That's when they come up with their clutch base hits. One and one the count. The pitch is bounced towards second base. Randolph to his right has it. Throw to first in time. And Willie almost stumbled as he threw. He looks back. But he gets him. The Royals come up with a run on two hits. One Yankee error. One man left. At the end of an inning and a half, the Royals three, the Yankees two. Take one fresh egg. Fry it. Add one slice of ham. Sizzle it. Top with a slice of American cheese. Sandwich them all into a buttered toasted bun, and you have the breakfast jack. A deliciously different sandwich from Jack in the Box that's made to order for people who are up early or up late. The breakfast jack. That's what's cooking at Jack in the Box. If all you need is money, come on into HFC. Is there something you want that would make your life a whole lot easier, more enjoyable? An HFC shopper's loan could be the best way to get it. Come on in and ask about a shopper's loan. Household finance, an equal opportunity lender. Come, come on in. Come on in. Come on in to HFC. Household finance. Where people use our money to get the most out of life. Come on in to HFC. All right, let's see if the Yankees can bounce back again. They were losing 2 0 in the bottom of the first, scored two runs to tie it. They are losing 3 2 now in the bottom of the second as Oscar Gamble steps in. Oscar's two for six, has one double and one run batted in. As we await. The end of a long commercial for the umpires to say time is in. Well, now that's what pays the freight for these televised games, so can't have your cake and eat it. All right, Art France gets the sign, does so off home plate, and Oscar Gamble ready to step in. It'll be Gamble, Randolph, and Stanley here in the bottom of the second. As this does not look like a pitcher's night tonight. Five runs already scored in the ball game. This is just the bottom of the second. Pitch to Gamble. A slow curve. Pull foul. Almost hit Elston Howard in the coaching box. Strike one. Split off hung that curve ball to Gamble. Oscar a little over anxious out in front. Nobody out. Nobody on. Split off winds. And the slider nicks the outside corner. It's 0-2. A shade gamble towards right field. The two-strike pitch high and away. One ball, two strikes. No action now in either bullpen. Here's the one-two pitch. Low and outside, two and two. <laughs> Willie Randolph walking around the on-deck circle. This youngster in his very first year, a chance to get in the World Series. Strike three, it nicked the outside corner. Gamble argues, but to no avail. And split off. Picks up his first strikeout. That's the first Yankee to get down on strikes. It brings up Willie Randolph. Willie is two for 14 in the series. No extra base hits. One run batted in. Pitch to Randolph. Strike one call. Started to say down low, and Willie questions the call. On deck, Fred Stanley. Brett even with the bag at third. Slow curve hangs outside. It's one and one. Cowan shades Randolph slightly in left center. Left fielder and right fielder straight away on Willie. That pitch down low. It's two and one. One out, nobody on. Bottom of the second. Split off. 
Big wind up, big kick. And the fastball popped up in right center, coming over Mac Ray. The right fielder calling for it. Backs up now and makes the catch. There are two out. And it will bring up Fred Stanley. Stanley, 5 for 12 with two doubles. No RBIs, batting 417 in the series. Stanley batting number nine in the Yankee lineup and on deck Mickey Rivers. Pitch to Stanley is a little bit high, ball one. Stanley does not give the pitcher an easy time. He takes a lot of pitches, fouls off a lot of pitches. No more an automatic out. There's a strike and it's one of one. Royals three runs on four hits. The Yankees two runs on three hits. Split off, shakes off one side. He's got the one he likes. And it's down low two and one. Collins is shading Stanley slightly over in right center field. Freddie Herzog really moving his fielders around on every Yankee batter. The 2-1 pitch is a bouncing ball. One hop to Brett. One hand grab. The long throw in time. He does have a good arm. Not always true, but strong. The Yankees go down in order, and at the end of two, it's the Royals three and the Yankees two. Sure is easy to say yes to the affordable Chrysler Cordova any time of the year. But right now, it's the end of the model year. And that means you can get a clearance deal on a luxurious Cordova. Sound good to you? Yes, yes, it's the time to say yes. At your Chrysler Plymouth dealers. And Cordova is one personal mid-sized luxury car that has a lot going for it, like many standard luxuries. No wonder Cordova is the most successful Chrysler ever introduced. And right now, you can get a clearance deal that'll put you behind the wheel of a luxurious Chrysler Cordova. Yes, yes, it's the time to say yes. At your Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Get you your in clearance deal at your local Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Yes! All right, the Yankees trailing three to two as we get ready for the top of the third inning. It'll be Tom Poquette, George Brett, and John Mayberry to face Ed Figueroa. And uh, Grant Jackson gets up right away and starts throwing in the Yankee bullpen. Neither manager is going to take too much time to uh, bring in a new pitcher. If they see who was ever on the mound getting creamed. Poquette struck out his first time up. And we're still waiting for the okay to play ball. Players are on edge because this is not fair to the players in a sense. They're ready to go and you got to wait. Figueroa now decides he's going to throw a couple more to stay warm. All right. They finally get the okay. Whether it's a wink, a whistle, or a finger. All right, the left-hander Poquette steps in. Pitch by Figueroa. He bunts right back to the mound. Figueroa, lucky he's got it, throws him out. That ball almost got by Figueroa for a base hit. He just barely got his glove down in time as Poquette bounced a hard one-hopper back to the mound. He's trying to drag it by the pitcher. One away, and now George Brett, who uh, got the Royals rally started in the first inning with a two-out double down the right field line. Brett now has seven hits in the series for the Royals. And the changeup hits the outside corner, strike one call. Figueroa rocks back. His pitch fouled upstairs and out of play. Back at third base. Nothing into the count. And 
Julio got his own fan club here tonight. That's one of our cameramen. The 0-2 pitch. High and tight. Makes Brett lean away from the plate. Wasn't that close, but the crowd gets a big kick out of it. So the way this Brett hangs in there. You gotta loosen him up a little bit. He really stands in there. The one-two pitch. Foul just to our left again. They're coming very close tonight. John Mayberry on deck. One out, nobody on top of the third. Royals in front, three to two. The windup and the pitch is popped up in the center field. Mickey Rivers moving in. Mick is under it and makes the catch. And I tell you, whenever you get Brett out, you breathe a sigh of relief. But now the big man's starting to get hot. We told you he just missed a grand slam homer in yesterday's game. He hit a two-run shot his first time up in this game. And now with two out, nobody on. Mayberry up there again. Mayberry had hit only three homers from the All-Star break to the end of the year. Takes a pitch way outside, ball one. Remember when we were kids and if you threw a pitch you didn't like, you'd say, oops, slips, and it wouldn't count even if you hit a home run, but can't work that here. Hard ground ball, Randolph has it, falls down, gets up, throws to first, they got him. Willie Randolph having a lot of trouble keeping his feet, but he makes the play. Three up, three down, and at the end of two and a half, the Royals three and the Yankees two. It's still not too late to enjoy the early shopper's discount of $5 on purchases totaling $50 or more from Sears' new Christmas wish book. But hurry, shop by phone from home or see a wish book at Sears' catalog order desk. The early shopper's discount from Sears' Christmas wish book. Sears, America Hi, this is Forrest Tucker. May I get personal with you for a minute? Even if you shower twice a day, you can't wash away jock itch. What you need is something made specifically for jock itch, and that's Cruex. C-R-U-E-X. Cruex medicated powder relieves the itching, the chafing, the rash. And because it's medicated, it can fight the cause of that itch. So if you suffer from chafing, rash, or jock itch, get Cruex. C-R-U-E-X. And get relief. Mickey Rivers, who started the Yankee rally in the bottom of the first with a long triple, a deep left one bounce off the wall and scored the Yankees' first run, will lead off for the Yankees here in the bottom of the third. It'll be Rivers, White, and Munson again. All three of them had base hits. Rivers, White, and Munson all got their hits off Dennis Leonard. And this will be the first time they'll be facing split off in this game. Split off is ready, but uh, the other network is not, and now they are, and Art Franz walks in back of the plate. Mickey Rivers steps into the batter's box. Poquette not playing quite as shallow as he was the first time Rivers was up. Brett is in at third. And here's split off's pitch, a curve high and tight, ball one. The big left-hander delivers again, foul down the left field line and back in the upper deck and out of play. Mick trying to shoot that way tonight. All right, split off gets the sign from Martinez. Curve, base hit up the middle, a high curveball. Mickey's specialty, and he lines a bullet back through the middle. And Rivers said he was going to have a good fifth game, and he is having it. 
A triple and a single, both hit on the nose. The first hit off, split off. Now the batter, Roy White, who singled deep in the hole and stole a base and scored in the first inning. Roy will just turn around and bat right-handed against the left-hander split off. And on deck, Thurman Munson. Showing it on the uh, replay screen, the hit by Rivers. How many times Mickey did that this year on high pitches? He leads away. Here's the stretch. And White squares to bunt, takes it low, ball one. Nelson Howard now comes over to talk with Mickey Rivers. Also to the first base umpire, Bill, uh, Larry McCoy. Tell him to checking for a balk. And Martin now telling the plate umpire, make sure he comes to a stop. Split off did not come to a stop, evidently. He comes set and throws to first base. Rivers is back. We mentioned in the other playoff games how some pitchers cheat a little bit and do not come to a stop when they come to the set position. Just that fraction of a second is the difference between a stolen base or not. Pitch to White, ready to bunt, takes it outside, two and nothing. three Yankees two bottom of the third nobody out Rivers at first split off sets and White bluffs a bunt takes a strike that time and it's two and one Roy thought it was outside so did Billy Martin but Art Franz is the one who counts two balls one strike Patek is shading White over towards second base. Mayberry holding the bag against Rivers. Brett even with the bag at third. And the outfield straight away on Roy White. Here's the stretch by split off. Throw to first base. Rivers is back. That was low, but Mayberry, a good glove man, backhanded it. All right, split off ready again. Another throw to first, and Rivers back easily. Still nobody out here in the bottom of the third. The split off gets the sign from Martinez. And the pitch. Roy goes to bunt outside, throw to first. Rivers back. And it's three and one. All four pitches. Roy White was ready to bunt. Now let's see if the Yankees try a hit and run. Maybe a take sign and then have Rivers running on three and two. So many things that Billy Martin could do right now. Let's see which one he picks. Three balls and a strike. Here's the stretch. The pitch outside. Ball four. Mickey Rivers bothering split off out on the mound. He lost his concentration. We'll pause for station identification on the New York Yankee Home of Champions Radio Network. WMCA Strauss Communications in New York. This is Mel Allen. At Emory Air Freight, your package not only gets a choice flight, it gets a choice of flights. Emory Air Freight, the shortest distance between two points. All right, Dick Hauser comes in to have a chat with Thurman Munson. The Yankees have their speed merchants on the base pass. Rivers at second, White at first, nobody out. The Yankees trailing three to two here in the bottom of the third. Thurman Munson, who ripped a single to left field his first time up the batter. Remember, Thurman Munson has eight base hits in the series. Stretch by split off. Pitch to Munson. Outside, ball one. Right now, and now, Galen Sisko, the pitching coach, is going to come out and have a chat with split off as we have double barrel action out in the bullpen. It looks like Mingori and Patton from here. (laughs) 
Could be Andy Haslin. Nevertheless, it's a left-hander, but that is not so important right now, just to let you know that the Royals have their bullpen working. The huddle out on the mound. They break it up. Galen Sisko comes back. We told you, whenever there's a pitching change, Whitey Herzog comes out to change the pitcher. Munson has the count of one ball, no strikes on him. It is Marty Patton, the right-hander, and Andy Hassler, the left-hander, throwing in the bullpen. Nobody out here. Bottom of the third. Royals lead 3-2. to two. Rivers at second. White at first. One ball, no strikes on Munson. Here's the stretch. And the pitch. Foul as Munson tried to shoot to right field. He fouled it off the auxiliary scoreboard. Just below the mezzanine over the Yankee uh, dugout. One and one the count. On deck, Chris Chambliss. White leads off first, Rivers off second. Split off ready, his pitch down the right field line, but it's curving and going foul deep in the corner. Would not have been far enough for a home run. And had it stayed fair, McRae would have been able to make the catch, but Rivers would have been able to tag up and go to third easily. It's a ball and two strikes on Munson. Well, last time Thurm had a count of 0-2 on him and ripped a single to left field. Let's see if he can duplicate that first inning feat. Patek tries to distract the hitter by waving his glove up in the air. Stretch by split off, runners lead away. Now the pitch. Foul back and out of play in the mezzanine and back of home plate. It's still a ball and two strikes. Great supply of baseballs brought up for plate umpire Art France. Oh, man, what a ball game. This is going to drain everyone physically and emotionally. This is only the bottom of the third, and the Royals lead three to two. Roy White with a good lead at first. Rivers off second. And again, the one-two pitch. Bouncer foul. That was a good pitch by split off down and in. And all Thurm could do was foul it. Almost in the dugout of the Royals. Hauser picks it up, flips it in the Kansas City dugout. Count remains a ball and two strikes. Nobody out. Split off gets the sign. Wheels and bluffs the throw to second. Rivers dives back head first, but there's no throw. Remember, you don't have to throw back to second base. Yesterday, the Royals tried that, and Doug Bird threw the ball out in the center field. All right, split off. Comes to the belt. And the runners are going line, base hit right center field. Rivers will score. White's going to go to third base. It's tied up at 3-3, and runners at first and third, and nobody out. There had to be a mix-up on that play because Roy White was running with the pitch, and Rivers was not running. But Munson saved Roy White there as he drilled a single to right center field to drive in Mickey Rivers. Tying up the ball game. And runners at first and third. Still nobody out. And Chris Chambliss the batter. Oh, man, I tell you. Chris Chambliss has driven in a run with a sacrifice fly for Munson. That was his second run batted in the series. Chambliss has driven in six. Got to wait as the ground crew picking up the streamers out in right field and left field. And this crowd going wild. The Yankees have come back for the second time in the ballgame to tie it up 
And what a chance to go ahead. Nobody out. White at third. Munson at first. And Chambliss the batter. Chambliss steps in. Munson leads off first. White off third. Here's the stretch. And the pitch fouled off the end of the bat. Strike one on a breaking pitch. Fielded by Dick Hauser who looks it over and flips it to George Brett. Still nobody out. Splithoff gets the sign. Runners lead at the corners. Pitch to Chambliss high and it's one on one. So Splithoff. Not enjoying the success he had in the first game when he relieved Dennis Leonard. He shut out the Yankees. Him coming on in relief. He sets. And the pitch foul just below us. It's a ball and two strikes. On deck, Carlos May. Chambliss, a big man. He hits a ground ball. Even if the Royals get a double play, a run will score. We're all tied at 3-3. Throw to first base. Munson back. Split off sets. And the pitch. Ground ball is second. They might get two, but we're going to get a run. They safe at first as Patek throw pulled Mayberry off the bag. So it'll be a run batted in for Chambliss. The Yankees lead four to three. Munson is out on a hard slide that made Patek throw the ball high. That's a fourth play from four to six. Another run batted in for Chambliss as White scores and the Yankees go out in front four to three. Now there's only one out. Chambliss at first and Carlos May the batter. Carlos fly to center his first time up. Chambliss now has driven in seven runs in the playoff series. And it is some difference when Mickey Rivers gets on base. Unbelievable how he picks up the whole team. One out. The pitch to May. Fly ball straight away center field. Cowens moves in. Chambliss halfway. And Cowens makes the catch for the second out. And it will bring up Greg Nettles, who popped a short his first time up. The Yankees four and the Royals three here in the bottom of the third. is called Bill Halla down the right field line. I don't know whether it's a banner or something that fell down over the right field fence. And Hal McRae goes over to pick it up, throws it to one of Jimmy Esposito's ground crew. And we're ready to go. Nettle steps in. Chambliss is at first with two out. Mayberry playing in back at Chambliss. Remember, Chambliss has one stolen base for the Yankees in this playoff series. The Yankees have only three. One by Randolph and one here tonight by Roy White. Here's the stretch by Splithoff. And the pitch outside with a breaking pitch, ball one. Split off to the belt. Curve outside, ball two, two and nothing. Trying to be very careful on Greg Nettles. 
Greg says that the injury to his uh, right foot has cut his stride down and he's swinging better. High pop up, shallow center, Patek backing up, Cowan's coming on, Patek still backing up and makes the catch. But the Yankees pick up two runs on two base hits, no errors, and two men left. And the score at the end of three innings, the Yankees four and the Royals three. Honey, you know the kids are growing up. Why don't we take a trip this summer the whole family will always remember? Enjoy the super flavor of America's favorite chocolate drink. It's got real goodness, protein goodness, and cool, refreshing taste. It's the top of the charge of the non-carbonated. Doesn't even have to be refrigerated. So isn't it time to do you who? You who chocolate drink. It's so delicious. You who chocolate drink. Isn't it time you knew you who? Great chocolate taste. So refreshing. And Yoo-Hoo contains high-quality protein made from 99% fat-free milk. Yoo-Hoo is not carbonated, needs no refrigeration before it's open. Get Yoo-Hoo and keep your action going. So isn't it time you do Yoo-Hoo? Yoo-Hoo chocolate drink. It's so delicious. Yoo-Hoo chocolate drink. Yoo-Hoo. Yoo-Hoo is another fine product of Iroquois brand. the Yankees lead four to three and I'd like to take this moment to uh, say how much I enjoyed doing radio for the Yankees again this year and uh, for WMCA Manchester Broadcasting unless this game is tied I will no longer be speaking to you Yankee fans over the radio this will be my last appearance and it's a very sad thing of course even if the Yankees win this go into the World Series we will not be broadcasting on this station but I'll turn it over to Frank Messi. You'll be hearing him a lot, Frank. Okay, Phil Rosetto, thank you very much. And fans, we'll be hearing you on radio again next year. Thank you, Frank. Okay, buddy. All right, good evening, everybody. Wherever you might be listening to New York Yankee baseball, and I don't know whether you're excited as we are, I'm sure you must be, whether you're a Yankee fan, a Royal fan, or just a plain old baseball fan, because excitement reigns supreme here tonight. Hal McCray is the batter as we go to the fourth inning. Right hand hitter. Figueroa looks down for his sign. And the first pitch to him is popped up on the right side of the infield. In comes Chambliss. Halfway to the plate. Makes the catch. That's all for McCray. One out. Nobody on. And we'll look now at Jamie Quirk. Well, the Royals took an early lead in the ball game on a first inning two-run homer by John Mayberry. The Yankees came back to tie it up. Royals took a three-to-two lead in the second, and the Yankees came back with two runs in the third. And the Yankees now lead four to three. Quirk is a left-hand hitter. He flied to left field his first time at bat. And he swings on the first pitch, bounces it over the mound, charging in Stanley in front of second. Quick throw, he's out. Shutstop Fred Stanley came in quickly to throw out Jamie Quirk. And now Cookie Rojas will step in. right hand hitter single stole second and scored in the second inning he takes low ball one right hand batter waiting swinging fly ball deep left field Roy White has room he's back he's under it he's got it and the side is retired in order in the middle of the fourth inning the scores the Yankees four and the Royals three honey you know the kids are growing up why don't we take a trip this summer the whole family will always remember? Come on in, come on in, come on in to HMC. If a little extra money could make this the summer of summers for your family, come on into HFC and ask about our vacation loan. HFC, an equal opportunity lender. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Sold by 
Finance, where people use our money to get the most out of life. Come on in to HFC. For a large or small loan, call HFC in New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut. See your phone book for the household finance office nearest you. Oscar Gamble will be the leadoff batter for the Yankees in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Gamble was called out on strikes his first time up in the ball game. I have never seen a more excited baseball crowd. Of course, I was not around in the great excitement days of the Yankees prior to 1964. I was fortunate enough to be in Baltimore in 66 when they won the pennant. But they won it on the road in Kansas City. And there was not much excitement there. But this crowd is just in a gala celebrating mood. Oscar Gamble will lead off the bottom half of the fourth inning. Gamble is two for seven in the series. The wind up by split off and Gamble. Did he butt at it? They appeal to the third base umpire and Larry Barnett says yes he did. He offered for the pitch. Oscar Gamble batted 232 over the season. He had 17 home runs, 15 of them here at the stadium. The 0-1 deal to him. Foul back, got him in on the fist. Really jammed him and he fouled it back on the left side. The Yankees have four runs on five hits. The Royals three runs on four hits. Paul Splitoff, relief starter Dennis Leonard in the first inning. Leonard first three batters. They all three had base hits and two of them scored. 0-2 delivery, low and outside. One ball and two strikes. The winner goes to Cincinnati and the loser goes home. And that's the whole season boils down to one ball game. The one-two pitch. Fastball low. Two balls and two strikes. The Yankees lost three games during the season due to rain that were not made up. So they played 159 regular season games, four playoff games, and now this is their 164th, a one-game season. 2-2 two -two pitch. It had the plate but low. Ball three, and it's three and two on Oscar Gamble. Willie Randolph is on deck. Down 2 nothing in the first. Rivers triple for the Yankees. White beat out an infield hit. Rivers scored. White stole second. Went to third on Munson's base hit and scored on a Chris Chambliss sacrifice fly. The Yankees then got two more runs in the third to take a 4-3 to three lead. The wide 3-2 pitch to Gamble. A bouncing ball slowly towards second. Charging Rojas. He's got a quick throw. He's out. A good play by Mayberry on a throw in the dirt. Gamble is out. On a close play at first base and credit Mayberry with making that play. Willie Randolph will be the batter. Randolph fly to right field his first time up. He is two for 15 in the series with one run batted in. During the season he hit 267. Right hand hitter and he lines one caught by Mayberry at first base. And there are two down. Brett Stanley will be the batter. Stanley grounded out to Brett at third in the second inning. So he's off for one, but he's had a good series. Five for 13. Brett really bolstered the Yankee infield this year. Playing shortstop. Checks his swing on a slow breaking ball. Ball one. Pitch was a bit low. Brett Stanley has been around in the major leagues. Seattle, Milwaukee, Cleveland, San Diego and the Yankees 1-0 pitch to him just missed low again two balls and no strikes one thing about a guy like Stanley he's always in demand one team lets him go another team wants him 2-0 pitch from split arm fastball low again ball three they play Stanley to the off field in the outfield on the infield they play him up the middle with Rojas shaded a bit toward the bag at second. 
Split off, 3-0 pitch. Strike called, it's 3-1. and one. Stanley looks down at Coach Hauser, and he'll probably take another one. Mickey Rivers is on deck. There are two out. Split off, fires, strike two called. Fred Stanley probably takes more pitches than any other Yankee batter. He does not mind getting that free ticket to first base. Now the payoff delivery. Fast and low, ball four. Stanley is on. Second walk given up by Split Off. So with two outs, the Yankees have a base runner, and the batter is Mickey Rivers, who is two for two. Rivers tripled over the head of the left fielder, Poquette, his first time up. Then he ripped a single to center field. He has scored both times he's been on base. The Yankees lead four to three. Rivers left-hand batter Brett in at third on the grass and a swing and a miss on an inside pitch. Mickey Rivers very possibly the fastest man in baseball. He missed 22 games over the regular season due to injuries. Pitch to him. A ball high. Even though he missed 22 games he scored 95 runs. He hit 312, and as a leadoff hitter all year long, he still had 67 runs batted in. He had eight triples and eight home runs. Given that high fastball, he'll give it a ride. He likes the pitch upstairs. 1-1 one, one delivery. Curve is fouled back right below the booth. One and two. Yankees lead four to three. Brett Stanley down at first and two outs here in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Split off. Looks into Martinez for the sign. Fred Potak waves his gloved hand in the air. One, two pitch. No, throw to first base instead. And Stanley was standing right on the back. Pretty Potak has a habit at times of waving the left hand, the gloved hand in the air from his shortstop position. I would think it would be distracting to a hitter. One, two pitch coming. Rivers lines it foul down the left side and well back in the seats. Stanley trots back to first base. One and two the count on Mickey Rivers. The left-hander split off six. And the one-two pitch. Breaking ball is drilled through the right side. Base hit. Stanley around second base trying for third. McRae's throw comes into second. And the Yankees have runners on the corners. Mickey Rivers is three for three. That is the Yankees' sixth hit in the ball game and their third off split off. So with two outs, the Yankees are threatening. The batter is Roy White. Switch hitting left fielder. Roy has been on base twice with an infield single, which drove in a run. And with a walk, he has also scored two runs, and he has stolen a base. The senior Yankee first put on the pinstripes in 1965 and a regular since 1967. The set by split off. The infield is up the middle. The outfield is spread. And the pitch is high and outside. Ball one. In the Royal Bullpen, right-hander Marty Patton and left-hander Andy Hassler are warming up. White spread out in the batter's box. Waiting for split off. The runners lead first and third. And the pitch... Outside and high ball two. In 1971, Roy White fielded 1,000. Did not make an error in left field. The only Yankee ever to have a perfect fielding record for a full season. Two all pitch to him. Outside ball three. Every time the 
well, not every time, both times that Rivers has been on base while Splitoff has been pitching, Splitoff has completely lost his concentration on the hitter. Cookie Rojas has come in to talk to Splitoff. Now he goes back to his second base position. Three balls and no strikes on Roy White. Rivers at first, Stanley at third, two out. 3-0 pitch. He takes high, ball four, and the bases are loaded. Rivers trots down to second. White is on with a walk. Whitey Herzog is coming out, and that is going to be all, I think, for Paul Splitar. Herzog looks toward his bullpen, and with the right hand hitting Thur Munson coming up, He'll bring Marty Patton into the ball game. Let's go back and recap the scoring briefly. The Royals got two runs in the first inning after two men were out. Willie Randolph made a fine play on a high chopper to throw out Al Cowens. Tom Polkett was struck out by Ed Figueroa. But then George Brett, the league's leading hitter, Double to the right field corner, his seventh hit of the championship series. John Mayberry, slumbering giant, homered the first home run for the Royals in the series. He just cleared the right field wall. Oscar Gamble climbed the fence, but just couldn't quite reach it. And the Royals had a 2-0 lead. The Yankees got the two runs right back when Rivers tripled over the left fielder Poquette. Roy White. Hit a ground ball in the hole at shortstop. Pontek got to it, but could not throw him out. Rivers scored. Then Roy White promptly stole second base. Thurman Munson single to left field. White held up and then could only go as far as third. Munson on Poquette's throw to the infield took second base. The Royals did not have a cutoff man out there, and you really can't blame Poquette. They just got mixed up a bit and had no cutoff man. So Munson aggressively went to second. Then Chris Chambliss hit a sacrifice fly to left field. Getting Roy White home with the tying run of the ball game. Munson really could have tagged up at second base and gone to third on a very bad throw from left field. But he did not do so. And the Yankees did not score another run as May and Nettles both skied. Then in the third inning, the Yankees picked out two runs. Rivers led off with a single to center. White walked. Thurman Munson drove in a run with a base hit. Chris Chambliss drove in a run with a force grounder to the second baseman. Carlos May flied out and Nettles popped up. And that's a summary on the scoring. A new record for a new Yankee stadium in attendance has just been announced. 56,821. And with that, we'll pause for station identification on the New York Yankee Home of Champions radio network. WMCA, Strauss Communications in New York. This is Mel Allen. Emory doesn't think anyone should discriminate against a package because of its size, weight, or destination. Emory Air Freight, the shortest distance between two points. Marty Patton is on the mound now for the Kansas City Royals. Patton is making his second uh, appearance. And his only other appearance, he came in, faced one batter. And gave up an intentional walk and was promptly taken out of the ball game. A move we did not understand from Whitey Herzog, but nonetheless. Patton, the right-hander. He's ready to pitch to Thurman Munson. Thurman Munson is two for two as Patton has completed his warm-up throws. Thurman has driven in a run. He is single to left and single to center. Base is loaded and two outs. There's the windup by Patton. The right hand his pitch is hit in the air to left field. But waiting for it, Poquette. And he makes the catch to retire the side. So Patton, with one pitch, gets the Royals out of trouble. 
For the Yankees, no runs, one hit. They leave the bases loaded. And at the end of four, the score is New York four and Kansas City three. <laughs> Get your first with the best. Get yourself up, go on dark. You're a hard man to beat. You've got wings on your feet. Get yourself up, go on dark. You're gonna win every time. With the going, going airline. Get yourself up, go on dark. If you're a businessman who's going places, Ozark is your airline. Our number one priority is to get you where you're going as quickly, comfortably, and efficiently as possible. That's why we plan our flight schedules and connections for the business flyer. And why we'll arrange for a rental car ready to go at your destination. If you're a businessman who's going places, Ozark is your airline. You can go direct to Central Illinois on Ozark jets and avoid changing planes. Call your professional travel advisor or Ozark for scheduled information. Ready for the fifth inning here at Yankee Stadium, Chris Chambliss. As you may have heard earlier, has driven in two runs in the ball game, seven RBIs for the series, tying a championship series record. Chris has done an outstanding job for the Yankees, perhaps a bit unsung. A lot of folks may not appreciate what Chambliss has done, not only with a bat this year, but with a glove down at first base. He is a much improved first baseman. Did it through very diligent work. Freddie Patek will lead off. Right hand hitting Patek has struck out his only time up. He has six hits in the series. Figueroa's first pitch, a slider, swung on and missed strike one. The catcher, Buck Martinez, is on deck, and then Al Collins. The Yankees lead the Royals 4-3. to three. Figueroa offers inside. One ball and one strike. Freddie Pontag at 5'4 and 140 pounds presents a very small strike zone. Figgy rocks and fires. The pitch is popped up foul outside of first. Chambliss is after it. He has room and makes the catch. Chris Chambliss near the rolled up tarpaulin in foul territory pulled it in. That'll bring up Buck Martinez. Martinez, single to right field to drive in a run, and he lines the first pitch over the head of Stanley in the left base head. So Martinez is two for two, and the Royals have their fifth base hit off Ed Figueroa. One out, a runner at first, and the top of the order coming on. Collins bounced to Randolph. Willie made a great play on the ball in the first inning. Didn't panic. Didn't try to short hop it. Just waited for the ball to come down and threw him out. Then he threw him out on a ground ball in the second. So Collins is 0 for 2. Chambliss holding on Martinez at first. Figueroa deals and he's high with a slider. Ball one. Tom Poquette is on deck. Infield plays up the middle. The outfield is spread. 1-0 delivery. Changeup is bounced to shortstop. Stanley has. Goes to the bag himself. Throws to first and gets the double play. Fred Stanley did not throw to Randolph. He went to the bag himself. And then threw Collins out to complete the double play. No runs. A base hit. No errors. And nobody left. At the end of four and a half innings, it's the Yankees four and the Royals three.
It was an idea whose time had come, and New York wanted it. The state legislature passed a new banking bill. The governor signed it. It's law. Now you can have your checking account of the bank that pays the highest allowable interest in your savings. The Lincoln. Free checking. No monthly charges, no minimum balances, no strings. When the Lincoln says free, we mean totally free. As long as you have a dollar in the Lincoln Savings Account, you can write all the free personalized checks you like. No matter how many you write, you don't pay a cent. No matter how low your balance, there's never a service charge. And at the Lincoln, you can also have the comfort of a Safety Zone account, your balance plus a $1,000 cushion. With a Lincoln Safety Zone account, you can write checks for up to $1,000 more than your balance without paying the $2 charge for overdrafts. When you borrow from your Safety Zone, your check is as good as if you had the money in your account. And interest on your Safety Zone loan stops the day you repay it. You've waited a long time for this. Call the Lincoln today. 782-6000. The Lincoln Savings Bank. 782-6000. Member FDIC. Now for the fifth inning. Left-hander Andy Hassler with the Yankee left-hand hitters Chambliss, May, and Nettles and Gamble coming up. Andy Hassler picked up from the California Angels in midseason. He was one short of a major league record when he lost 18 games in a row. After he lost his 18th, he won four in a row. He pitched well against the Yankees during the regular season. Andy Hassler. And let's check out his record. He completes his warm-up throws and will be ready to face Chris Chambliss. Andy Hassler is 0-1 in the championship series. Pitched five innings, allowed four hits. Walk three, struck out three. Chris Chambliss has driven in two runs tonight with a sacrifice fly and a ground ball. He is over one officially. Chris has eight hits in the series in 18 official at bats, seven runs batted in. And the first pitch to him is a ball inside. Carlos May is on deck. The Yankees lead 4-3. to three. The windup by the left-hander Hassler. The pitch, a curve is hit in the air to right center field. It is deep. Going back, McCray, and the ball is off the wall. McCray plays it on a bounce, and Chambliss is in with a stand-up double. The ball hit on the warning track in front of the 385-foot sign, and Chris Chambliss has just collected his ninth championship series hit. That ties Pete Rose's playoff series record, nine base hits for Chambliss. He has hit in every game of the championship series. He hit in the last nine games of the regular season. He has a 14-game hitting streak going. The Yankees long ago set a New record for two base hits in championship play. Pete Rose, in the 1972 National League Championship Series, had nine base hits for the Cincinnati Reds. Carlos May will be the batter. The Yankees now have seven hits in the ballgame. Carlos May has fly twice to center field. Left-hander against left-hander. Chambliss leads away at second. The corner men are in, Brett and Mayberry. And the pitch is in for a strike. Brett stays in close at third and on the grass. The left fielder Poquette straight away. Out in center field, Collins is straight away, and in right field, McCray is almost lost. He's way back. Swing and a miss, strike two. No balls and two strikes to Carlos. 
Yankees lead it four to three. Chambliss at second. Nobody out. Hassler takes plenty of time reading Martinez's sign. Now the tall left-hander drops the hands. The kick, the 0-2 pitch, he struck him out swinging. Looked like a good fastball. He just challenged Carlos May. Only the second Yankee to strike out in the ballgame. Greg Nettles is the batter. Nettles is 4 for 16 in the series with two home runs. Four runs batted in. Tonight he has popped up both times to the shortstop Patek. Patek plays him almost behind second base and that forces Chambliss to shorten up on his lead. Now Martinez goes out to the mound as he and Hassler are having a little trouble with their signs. With Patek playing Nettles almost behind the bag. Chambliss cannot take much of a lead. And he might have trouble scoring on a base hit. The left fielder Poquette is being waved in. He was playing Nettles deep and left. They wave him in. The center fielder Cowan shades around toward the right uh, field side. And McCray in right field is almost back at the warning track and well over toward the corner. Hassler is ready and the pitch to Nettles. Fast and low for a ball. Oscar Gamble is on deck. Now the 1 0 pitch to Greg Nettles. He pops it up on the right side. Mayberry, the first baseman on the foul line, calling for it and now takes it in fair territory. And there are two out. Chambliss at second, two down, and Oscar Gamble is the batter. Gamble has been called out on strikes and grounded out to second. Willie Randolph comes out on deck. Hassler, a very deliberate worker. Checks the runner, and the pitch is swung on and fouled at the feet of the catcher, Martinez. Plate umpire Arthur France takes a look, a look at it, tosses it back out to Hassler. No balls and one strike, two outs. The Yankees lead 4-3 to three here in the bottom half of the fifth. Against Gamble, the gap is in left center field with Cowan shaded over toward right. Poquette shades a bit toward center, but not that much. Breaking ball misses outside, and it's one and one. Can you just imagine the scene here at the stadium? The Yankees win this ball game. Yankee fans have waited since 1964. One-one delivery. Inside almost hit him. Bill Kane, the Yankee traveling secretary and statistician, is sitting in the booth with us. And uh, Bill, get out the calculator and figure if they can rebuild the stadium in time <laughs> for more play against Cincinnati if the Yankees win this one. Oh, boy. Two balls and a strike on Gamble. The pitch. Line foul down the left side and in the seats. Two balls and two strikes. Chambliss trots back to second base. Willie Randolph is waiting on deck. This has been quite a series. The Yankees won the first game. The Royals won the second. The Yankees won the third. The Royals won the fourth. Two balls and two strikes. Two outs. And now Gamble steps out. I don't know whether you believe in tradition or superstition, but there has never been a team in championship series play that has won the second game that has lost the series. Two and two pitch coming. Inside almost hit him again. Ball three. 
course, a lot of records have been set in this series. Why not set another one? Three and two the count. Hassler peers in. Now he stretches. Payoff pitch. It is a check swing bouncer down the third base line. They let it roll foul. Hassler bounced off the mound as soon as the ball kicked foul. He slapped it. I don't know what brings it to mind, but I thought it was a real cute line I read in one of the New York papers today. Bob Euchre, who broadcast the Milwaukee Brewer games in the American League and has been working for ABC in their telecast of the championship series, was asked about his greatest day in baseball. He said he remembered it well. He said his greatest day in baseball was on a night in San Francisco after a day game. I asked Bob if that was a true story, and he said, Frank, you can believe it. A night I'll never remember, or never forget. <laughs> Three and two. Now Hassler steps out. Hassler takes a long time as if he a little leery about throwing that baseball up there. Chambliss leads away again. And the three two pitch. Low ball for Gamble walks. Oscar Gamble at first base, Chris Chambliss at second, and the batter will be Willie Randolph. Randolph has flied the right and lined out to the first baseman. Hassler kicks and delivers high, ball one. And Galen Sisko, the pitching coach, comes out again. They've won a pretty good trail from the Kansas City Royal dugout to the pitcher's mound tonight. Four pitchers have been used in the ball game. Cisco's made about three or four trips out there. Galen Cisco pitched what for the Mets? Four years. Pitched part of a year for Kansas City, was their player coach at Omaha, their top farm club one year, and then they called him back up to be pitching coach for the Major League Club. He was pitching coach when Bob Lemon managed the Kansas City Royals. That'd be quite a job. That's like being a hitting instructor for a Ted Williams team. One and out to Randolph. Fastball is outside. Willie Randolph batting with runners at first and second and two outs. Two balls and no strikes to him. Hassler kicks and offers and the pitch is bounced foul at the plate. When Galen Sisko was the pitching coach for Bob Lemon, I asked him just how it felt to be a pitching coach for a man that everybody knew would eventually be in the Hall of Fame. And he said, well, there is one thing, the one thing he could do that Lem couldn't, and that was communicate better with the younger ball players. Two ball, one strike count. The pitch to Randolph, high and outside. Off-speed pitch that time from Hassler. Three balls and a strike, two outs, two on. The Yankees lead it four to three here in the bottom half of the fifth inning. Fred Stanley is on deck, 3-1 pitch, high ball four. The bases are loaded. Chris Chambliss moves on to third. Oscar Gamble goes down to second. Willie Randolph on first. For the second inning in a row, the Yankees have loaded the bases. And with two outs, the batter is Fred Stanley. Early in the year, when the Yankees thought the Red Sox would be their main opponents for the American League Championship, Fred Stanley really tore Red Sox pitching up. Right-hand batter, and he takes a fastball over strike call.
Brett Stanley was the last Yankee to hit a grand slam home run in the old Yankee Stadium. He's up with the bases loaded. The 0-1 pitch. Strike two called on a delayed call by Arthur France, and that brings Billy Martin off the Yankee bench up on the edge of the steps. Billy Martin really screaming in the direction of the plate umpire. A delayed call. The count is 0-2 on Fred Stanley. A base hit here could break things wide open. Bases loaded, but remember two outs. The windup and the 0-2 pitch. Outside and high, a ball 1-2. and two. They don't play Stanley to pull. The infield plays him up the middle, but the outfield swings around to the right side on the chicken. They call him chicken for the way he runs. His arm sort of flaps like a chicken's wing. The result of a broken arm some years ago became a habit with Freddy. The wind up, the one-two pitch from Hassler. High, a fastball. Two balls and two strikes. Oscar Gamble at third, or rather Chris Chambliss at third, Oscar Gamble at second, and Willie Randolph at first. Two balls and two strikes, two outs. Pitch on the way, line drive, caught by the second baseman, Rojas, to retire the side. No runs, one hit, the Yankees leave the bases loaded at the end of five. The score, the Yankees four and the Royals three. I want a beer like no other beer. I'm shape for people. I want flavor that won't disappear. I'm shape for people. Consistency makes a great beer. And Schaefer's consistently great tasting every single time because Schaefer's brewed the old world way. Croisoning, we call it. Since 1842, Croisoning, the extra step of brewing twice, has kept Schaefer consistently fresh and crisp, consistently great tasting, beer after Schaefer beer. I want a beer like no other beer. I'm shape for people. I want flavor that won't disappear. I'm shape for people. Shape for beer goes straight to your thirst. Your last one tastes as good as your first. Go out and get a shape for every shape of people. Go out and get a shape for every shape of people. Shape for people. Shape for people. We talked a few moments ago about uh, Chris Chambliss having nine base hits. Thurman Munson, with two base hits in this ball game tonight, also has nine. So both he and Chambliss have tied Pete Rose for the most hits in a Major League Championship Series. And, of course, both uh, Munson and uh, Chambliss will have another time at bat in this ball game. Outside of the players themselves, I guess the biggest uh, stir from the crowd came when Telly Silvalis came in to take his seat behind the Yankee dugout. Must have been a big thrill for him to get really a standing ovation from the folks there who recognized him. We go to the top half of the sixth inning. Tom Poquette will lead off for the Kansas City Royals. Polkett is struck out and bounced back to Figueroa. Figgy had a little problem in the first inning when he gave up a two-run homer to Mayberry. Since then, he's pretty well settled down. His first pitch, over, but low ball one. Polkett, a left-hand batter. one delivery. Strike on the inside corner. Boquette has had a couple of knee operations. He's also had surgery on his face as the result of hitting the wall in Kansas City earlier this year. So the youngster has had some problems early in his major league career. The 1-1 pitch. Bouncing ball toward Randolph to his right. Well, he has it. Sets, throws. He's out. One down. And now George Brett. George Brett won the American League batting title in the last game of the season. The the, uh, Kansas City Royals were playing the Minnesota Twins. Three men in the ball game had a chance to win it. Brett, his teammate Hal Hal McRae, and also 
Rod Carew of Minnesota. Brett got an inside the park home run to win it. The first pitch to the left hand batter is high, ball one. Brett doubled in the first inning. He was on when Mayberry homered. In the third, Brett flied to center. He's had seven hits in this series. The pitch is outside. The count is two balls and no strikes. One out, the base is empty. The Yankees lead four to three. Pitch to Brett. High ball three. Three balls and no strikes. It's hard to defend against a George Brett. He slaps the ball around. Does not go for power. He might be a home run hitter if he tried, but instead he's an average hitter. For high average, I mean. Strike call, three and one. During the season, he had 34 doubles, 14 triples, seven homers, 67 runs batted in. He had 215 base hits, a new Kansas City record. 3-1 delivery. Lined out to our right center field. Rivers on the move and makes the catch. Mickey Rivers got a good jump on the ball. Pulled it in, running to his left. There are two down here in the top half of the sixth. The batter will be John Mayberry. Mayberry has had uh, three hits in the series. One of them tonight, that was a two-run homer in the first inning. In the third, he grounded out to Willie Randolph, who threw him out from shallow right field. The Yankees overshipped on Mayberry, putting Stanley and Randolph on the first base side of second. Greg Nettles plays a normal shortstop position. And now a conference out at the mound as Munson went out. He wanted Nettles to come in. The outfield swings well around toward right. Gamble over in the corner. Rivers in right center. Roy White in left center. Figueroa looks into Bunsen for the sign, the wind, and the pitch to Mayberry. Fast and high, ball one. Mayberry steps out of the batter's box, now back in. Figueroa kicks and deals. Mayberry takes high again. Two balls and no strikes. Hal McRae is on deck. A lot of balloons floating around the stadium. 2 deal. Swing and a miss. He was going for the downs. Now third base coach Chuck Hiller goes out and corrals a couple of those balloons. Two-on pitch to Mayberry. Swung on and lined down toward the right field corner. Fair or foul. It's a fair ball in play off the wall, and it's held to a single. Oscar Gamble played the carom perfectly and fired in to Willie Randolph, and he holds John Mayberry to a long single off the wall at the 310-foot mark in the corner. That is base hit number six for the Kansas City Royals, and it brings up Hal McRae, who has struck out and popped up. Right-hand batter. Chambliss holding on Mayberry. The set by Figueroa and the pitch. Check swing bouncer out toward the mound. Fielded by Figueroa. He spins, throws to first. He's got him. And the side is retired. No runs, a base hit. The man is left. And at the end of five and a half innings of play here at Yankee Stadium, the score, the New York Yankees four and the Kansas City Royals three. Hello, this is Roger Miller with a money-saving solution to what could be a serious problem. Chances are pretty darn good that the shocks on your car are pretty darn bad. You see, shocks wear slowly. You're not usually aware of the problem. So you have to make that sudden turn, quick stop, or jarring ride over a rough stretch of road. So here's the money-saving solution. The heavy-duty shock sale at your Gabriel Shock Absorber dealer. Now's the time to save on Gabriel's new low-priced heavy-duty shock, the Roadstar. Or for more control when the going gets rough, save on Red Riders, Gabriel's premium heavy-duty shock. Either one of them will give you a real bonus in driving safety and comfort. So don't wait. Check out the heavy-duty shock sale now at your participating Gabriel dealer. 
king of the road. Available at Tilden Bedford, 1753 Bedford Avenue, Brooklyn. Tilden Hamilton, 6200 Fort Hamilton Parkway, Brooklyn. Tilden Northern, 3036 Northern Boulevard, Long Island City. Well, if the Yankees win this ball game tonight, box and reserve seat tickets will go on sale here at Yankee Stadium Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. That, of course, would be for the World Series. It's first come, first serve. Tickets, as by mail, are available only in strips for all three games with a limit of four per customer. Box seats are $45 per strip. Reserve seats are $30 per strip. Remember, box and reserve seat tickets will go on sale at Yankee Stadium Saturday morning at 9 o'clock should the Yankees win the ball game tonight. And should the Yankees win the game tonight, they can thank this man. Leading off right now, Mickey Rivers. Mick the Quick is 3 for 3, a triple and two singles. He bunts out in front of the plate. He's running hard, picked up by uh, Martinez. No throw! Mickey Rivers butting for his fourth base hit of the ball game. We pause for station identification on the New York Yankee, home of champions, Radio Network. WMCA, Strauss Communications in New York. This is Mel Allen. On its 30th birthday, Emory Air Freight has this advice for you. Never trust an air freight company under 30. Mickey Rivers dropping a bunt down right in front of the plate. And his blazing speed carried him down to first base. He's four for four. Roy White, the batter, he's had a perfect night with a single and two walks. Left-hander Hassler kicks and delivers, and White wanted a bunt, and the pitch is high. Ball one. White beat out an infield hit and drove in a run in the first inning. It followed a triple by Mickey Rivers. Roy walked in the third and scored. He also walked in the fourth. Bottom half of the sixth. Rivers on. Nobody out. Hassler kicks and delivers. White bunch down the first baseline. Charging in. Mayberry is up with a spin. Throws back to first to Rojas covering in time. Roy White is out and on a sacrifice. Rivers goes to second. A sacrifice 3-4. And now Thurman Munson. Thurman is two for three. Munson and Chambliss lead the Yankees in hitting in the series. They each have nine hits. Munson is nine for 21. Chambliss is nine for 20. And again, pitching coach Galen Sisko is on his way out to the mound. If either Munson or Chambliss gets another base hit in this ball game, they will establish a new championship series record for base hits. They are both tied with Pete Rose of Cincinnati who had nine hits in the 72 National League Championship Series. The mound conference breaks up. We'll see if they try to pitch around Munson. Elston Howard looking into Billy Martin and the Yankee dugout started out toward the foul line trying to get Rivers' attention. Now Ellie is back in the coaching lines. We're waiting now for the gate to be closed in left field as members of the grounds crew picked up some of the debris. One out, Rivers at second. Yankees lead 4-3. Hassler is ready. The pitch taken on the inside corner. Strike one. Munson steps out, adjusts the batting glove on his left hand. No balls, one strike on Thurman. They bunch him up the middle. The outfield spread out. The 0-1 pitch. He swings and lines a base hit into right field. That will score Rivers easily. After the ball, McCray. Munson's going to go for two. The throw to second base. It'll be close. He is out at second base. Freddie Patek tags him out on a perfect throw from Hal McCray. But the Yankees now lead 5-3. Thurman Munson driving in his second run of the ball game and his third of the series. He is out trying to stretch it into a double. The play going 9-6. So 
So Thurman Munson is now the first man ever to have 10 base hits in a postseason championship series. There are two down, nobody on, and Chris Chambliss is the batter. Chambliss tonight has driven in two runs with a sacrifice fly, a ground out. He doubled to no avail in the fifth. Let off the inning with a two-base hit, but was stranded at third when the Yankees left the bases loaded. The Yankees lead it five to three. The crowd is chanting, we're number one. These fans are really excited. First time since 1964. The first pitch to Chambliss, low and away, a breaking ball from the Southpaw Hassler. While you wait 12 years, you've got a right to get excited. The windup and the 1-0 delivery. High ball two. Carlos May is on deck. The Yankee hitting production has come from the top of the batting order tonight. 2-0 delivery. Breaking ball is over. The Yankees have nine hits. Eight of them from the top three men in the order. Four for Rivers, one for White, three for Munson. Nobody below Chambliss has had a base hit. Chambliss has his second hit of the game. A looper out into center field. So Chris is on, and that is his tenth hit. He has tied Munson. So Chris Chambliss is now two for three in this ball game, and the batter will be Carlos May. All of the Yankee hits have come from their top four hitters, Rivers, White, Munson, and Chambliss. Down at first base, Mayberry will not hold Chambliss on. He's going to play the line against Carlos May, a left-hand hitter. Yankees now show five runs on ten hits. Royals had three runs on six hits. Carlos May has twice fly to center and once struck out. Two outs, Chambliss walks off his lead at first base. Hassler has the sign for Martinez. The infield is up the middle on Carlos May. Sidearm fastball is high, ball one. Thurman Munson and Chris Chambliss have batted safely in all five games of the series. Carlos May fouls one back. Got just a piece of it off the tip end of the bat. One ball and one strike. You can just feel the tension building in this crowd here at the stadium. Electrifying. One ball, one strike. There goes Chambliss. The pitch is swung on and missed. Throw to second base. And he's safe at second. Chris Chambliss steals second. The hit and run was on, and Carlos May missed the pitch, and Chambliss beats Martinez. Throw to second base. That is the second stolen base in the series for Chambliss, who had only one all season. What an aggressive ball club the Yankees are. One, two, pitch to Carlos. Check swing, bouncer slowly toward third, charging Brett. He's up with it, throws to first, and it's juggled by Mayberry. Here comes Chambliss. He's safe at home. Chris Chambliss scores all the way from second. The Yankees lead six to three. George Brett charged a slow bouncer. He threw it in the dirt, and John Mayberry could not handle it. An error will be charged to George Brett, the third baseman, and Chris Chambliss scores all the way from second. The Yankees lead 6-3. There will be no run batted in.
And again, time is called as the grounds crew comes out to clean up the outfield. Streamers of tissue paper being tossed from the stands. Greg Nettles will step in when things calm down. This place will be a madhouse if the Yankees win this ball game. Fans so excited, they're on their feet all the way around. Greg Nettles has been colored tonight on three pop-ups, two to Patek the shortstop and one to Mayberry at first. Mayberry will hold May on. Two outs, the Yankees lead 6-3. Hassler is ready to work. Left-hander kicks and deals inside. Ball one. McCray deep in right field. Cowan shades toward right. The left field of Poquette is straight away, and there's a gap in left center. Time call now by the first base umpire, Larry McCoy. And I believe we're going to get a pinch runner for Carlos May. Carlos May goes to the dugout. And Billy Martin will send a pinch runner out, and the runner will be Sandy Alomar. Sandy Alomar goes out to run. Meanwhile, Greg Nettles and third base coach Hauser have a conference down the third base line. Sandy Alomar running for May at first. Hassler has the sign. One ball and no strikes on Nettles and the pitch. A breaking ball is over. Strike call. Good looking curve from Andy Hassler. Alomar looking over toward third base coach Hauser. We'll keep an eye on him for you. Throw to first base, Alomar gets back. Yankees protest to uh, balk on Hassler, but to no avail. There goes Alomar. The pitch is taken for a ball. Throw to second base, and he's out at second. Potteg makes the tag. Alomar is thrown out by Martinez to retire the side. But the Yankees pick up a couple of runs and at the end of six, the score, the Yankees six and the Royals three. If you're like most buyers of regular gasoline, you probably think unleaded gasolines just don't perform. Sure, unleaded gives you a nice clean engine, but it just doesn't have the pep of your regular. Or for that matter, the low price. Well, you regular buyers are in for a little surprise. Getty Unleaded Regular. Getty's unleaded gasoline has a high enough octane to be classified as regular. Most unleaded's don't. Yet Getty Unleaded Regular actually sells for less per gallon than most other major unleaded's. So if you want the octane performance of regular, plus the clean running smoothness of unleaded, and you want to pay less, you want Getty Unleaded Regular. Getty. Once again, we've got what's best for your car. Through six innings of play, the Yankees six runs, ten hits, one error. The Royals three runs, six hits, and one error. And it's a good thing Bill White is coming over here because... I am just completely worn out, I think, Bill. I'm a little hoarse myself, Frank Messer. The Yankees bouncing back like they've done all year long. They lead it by a score of 6-3. to three. And as Phil Rosito said when he left after three, my last chance on uh, the Yankee Home of Champions radio network. So I want to thank all the folks who are so kind to listen to Yankee ball games this year, whether here in New York or around the network in the other cities. We thank you for your very kind letters. We also thank you for your letters of 
constructive criticism. <laughs> uh, Bill White, let me say this to you. It's been a pleasure working with you, buddy. Frank, I've enjoyed it, too. Each year it gets to be a little better. Okay. All right. Frank Messer. Jamie Quirk now will lead off for the Royals. We're in the top of the seventh. The Yankees lead 6-3. to three. Quirk's a left-handed batter. And he takes outside from Figueroa. He's over two, fly to left, bounce to short. Big, tall, left-handed hitter. Drove in two runs last night. He went one for three. Figueroa rocks, and the 1-0 pitch. High. Two balls, no strikes. Well, the Yankees get a little action in their bullpen. Grant Jackson. And a Dick Tidrow. A left-handed and right-hander. So far, Figueroa's given up three runs on six base hits. Here's the 2-0. Called strike on the outside corner. It's two and one. Leaning on deck is Cookie Rojas, the second baseman. They play Quirk straight away. Here's a two-one delivery. High. Three balls and a strike. Figueroa trying to sneak a fastball past Quirk. And got it up a little bit too high. And as the home plate umpire, Art France, the ball might have been too low. Here's the 3-1 pitch now. Swung on line. Chambliss makes the catch. And Quirk just spins around, throws his bat up in the air. There's one away. Chris Chambliss having some kind of series. Not only with the bat, but with the legs and with the leather. Oh, there's one out. Nobody on the batter, Cookie Rojas. Roa, single to center, back in the second inning, stole second and scored on a single by Buck Martinez. And he takes the strike. Rojas is also fly to left field, so he's one for two. Here's a one-strike pitch. Went too far, it's two strikes. Rojas tried to hold up, but he went too far. It's no balls and two strikes. And after every pitch, there's some reaction from the Yankee fans here at Yankee Stadium. He can sense that flag flying here for the first time since 1964. Breaking ball has popped straight back. Coming back is Munson really digging back, and he slides, can't get to it. Ball hits up against the restraining wall downstairs. And Munson gets a hand for effort. No balls, two strikes on Rojas. On deck is Freddy Pate. No matter who wins this thing, both these teams should be proud of the way they've come back. They've kept battling each other. They've shown the fans here a lot of exciting baseball. We've had a lot of stolen bases, hit and running, taking the extra bases, excellent defensive plays, even some bad defensive plays. Here's the 0-2 to Rojas. It's low. One ball, two strikes. Very aggressive baseball on the part of the Yankees and the Kansas City Royals. Here's a 1-2 to Rojas. Breaking ball is outside. Two balls, two strikes. So far, we've had only one complete game in the series. That was the opener when Catfish Hunter won it 4-1, and he went the full nine. Both managers have gone to their bullpens quite a bit. Pitches it up the middle. Stanley to his left has a nice hop. Skip throws on the first base. of got Rojas. Two down. Oh, with two outs, nobody on top of the seventh. The Yankees ahead 6-3. The batter is Fred Patek, the shortstop. Patek has struck out and fouled out. He's 0 for 2. Little fella 6 for 16 in the series. He's driven in four runs in the series so far for the Royals. And he fouls the first pitch off. Upper deck right side. Out of play. Figueroa now with a new baseball. Goes on the back side of the mound, rubs it up. Nettles shortens up at third for Patek. Used to be a pretty good bunter. Here's the one strike pitch to him. Curve ball is high, a ball and a strike. Yankees have six runs on ten hits. The Royals three runs on six. Each team has made an error. We're playing the top of the seventh. Figueroa's 1-1 pitch. 
Call strike to a curve ball. Knee high outside corner. One ball, two strikes. Figueroa looking long for a sign for Munson. He's got it. And the one, two. Breaking ball. One hopper to Nettles. Off his glove. Stanley picks it up. Throws the first. Not in time. Not in time. Patek beats it out. A smash to the left of Nettles. He went to his left. Got the glove on a ball. Ball kicked off his glove. Stanley over behind. He picked it up. And he just missed getting uh, Patek at first base. And that should be a base hit. We'll wait on a scoring rule. Anyway, Patek is on at first base. There are two outs, and the batter is Buck Martinez, the catcher. Martinez has singled twice in this ball game. Base hit for Freddie Patek. That's the seventh base hit of the ball game for the Royals. We've got a double, a home run, and uh, five singles. Here's the pitch to Martinez, and he takes inside. Buck Martinez, four for 13 in the series. No home runs, four runs batted in. He bats right-handed. Batted just 228 on the year for the Royals, but he's an excellent defensive catcher. The 1-0, high, two balls, no strikes. With well, that base hit, Patek along with Munson and the Chambliss, the only players in the series to have hit in all five games. Now Figueroa taking a little more time as Jackson and Tidro continue to warm up in the Yankee bullpen. Figueroa sets. And the 2-0. Low, three balls, no strikes. On deck is Al Cowens, the leadoff man. Nettles, Stanley, Randolph, Chambliss around the infield with Chambliss holding on Patek at first. Here's a 3-0. It's taken, and it's a strike. Three and one. Yankee outfield, white and left. Rivers shaded a bit toward right center. And Gamble straight away and right. Munson flashing signs for Figueroa. Ted gets one he likes and sets. Here's a 3-1. Called strike two. Three balls, two strikes. So Patek will be running from first base on this 3-2 pitch with two outs. And the Yankees now want to get the attention of Chambliss. They want him to play behind Patek. And he does. Runner going. The pitch hit in the air left field. White coming on. Right there now. And he's got it. Side retired. No run. A base set. A man left on base. Bottom of the seventh coming up. Yankees six, Royals three. Colonial's Yankee Frank. The beef franks with the taste that takes you out to the ball game present the flavor of Yankee baseball. Frank Crescetti supplied the key hits in the four-game 38 series sweep of the Cubs. This eighth-inning homer brought the Yanks from behind to win game two. There's the pitch. A hard hit fly ball going far out into left field. Reynolds goes near it, and the ball is over the fence for a home run. Crosetti hitting a home run over the left center field fence, diving in Hogue ahead of him and putting the Yankees out in front. The first home run of the series, it's hit by Frankie Crosetti. He drives in two runs and the Yankees are out in front by a score of four to three. The flavor of Yankee baseball is brought to you by Colonial Yankee Frank. The only Frank sold at Yankee Stadium are now available at supermarkets near you. So you can enjoy that famous baseball flavor on your own home plate. Colonial's Yankee Franks, the beef Franks with the taste that takes you out to the ball game. The Yankees have a 6-3 lead over the Kansas City Royals. And the Yankees will send in Greg Nettles, who was up when Alomar was cut down trying to steal the end of the sixth inning. Then they'll have Oscar Gamble, and uh, then Willie Randolph against Sandy Hassler. To recap the ball game, the Royals took a 2-0 lead in the first inning on a two-run home run by John Mayberry against Ed Figueroa. The Yankees came back and tied it up in the bottom of the first with two runs. White and Chambliss picking up the RBIs. 
Royals went ahead in the top of the third with a run. They led 3-2 at the end of one and a half. And the Yankees came right back in the bottom half of the third inning. They used a single by Rivers, a walk to White, an RBI single by Munson, and a bounce out by Chambliss with Munson scoring to go ahead 4-3. And they added two more insurance runs against Andy Hassler in the sixth inning. Bunt single by Rivers, sacrificed by White, RBI single once again by Munson. Then Chambliss stole a base, and when uh, Carlos May bounced one to the third baseman, Brett, Brett threw it badly to the first baseman, Mayberry, who bobbled it. Chambliss, around to third, came on and scored. Well, the Yankees lead 6-3, to three, bottom of the seventh. Here's Hessler's first pitch to Nettles, and it's inside a ball. Big gap for Nettles out in left center field. Here's the 1-0 pitch. Outside, two balls, no strikes. Mark Littell, a right-hander, is getting loose in the Royal bullpen. The Royals have used four pitchers in this ball game. Denny Leonard starter, he didn't get anybody out. Paul Splittorf in the first, Marty Patton in the fourth, Andy Hassler in the fifth. The only Royal who has not seen action, the only pitcher, Al Fitzmaurice. The 2-0 pitch is high to Nettles, three balls, no strikes. Greg has popped a short twice and popped the first. He's over three. Here's a 3-0. Low ball four gets past the catcher. Nettles hustling the first base. Martinez comes up with the ball and Nettles will hold it first. So Greg Nettles walks, leading off the seventh. Now Dick Hauser wants to talk to Oscar Gamble, who's a do-better. Gamble is struck out, bounced to second, and walked. He probably wants Gamble to bunt that ball. Yankees already have a three-run lead, and they need another one. Of course, they need as many as they can get. But you never can tell in baseball. Royals don't have a power team, but they can string together a lot of base hits. Oscar Gamble's in. Nettles off first. He's being held there by Mayberry. Here's a set and the pitch. Gamble squares and bunts out in front of the plate. Up with his Martinez. His play will be the first base, and he makes it in time to Rojas, the second baseman covering. So Gamble does his job. Perfect sacrifice to put out two to four. Nettles now down at second base. The batter's Willie Randolph, and out pops Whitey Herzog. He's going out to the mound. Looks like he might want that right-hander, Mark Littell, and he does want Littell. Well, that'll be all for Andy Hasler. The Royals will use their fifth pitcher of the ball game. So Hasler leaves. And the right-hander Mark Littell comes on. This is the third appearance of the series for Mark Littell. He pitched the ninth inning. Saturday afternoon when Catfish Hunter beat the Kansas City Royals 4-1. to And he also pitched here Tuesday night. Pitched the sixth inning. Seventh and eighth innings uh, for the Kansas City Royals. As Doc Ellis beat Andy Hassler. The Yankees won that ball game 5-3. So Littell comes on to replace Andy Hassler with Nettles down at second base and one man out in the bottom half of seventh inning the Yankees leading six to three over the Kansas City Royals and while Littell gets ready let's take 15 seconds for station identification on the New York Yankee home of champions radio network WMCA Strauss Communications in New York this is Mel Allen a package shouldn't have to go out of its way to get where it's going Emory Air Freight the shortest distance between two points. Well, to recap the games for you, as Littell still hasn't uh, started warming up, now Martinez will go back behind the plate to recap the games of this 1976 championship series. The opening game was played out in Kansas City on Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, rather. In Kansas City, the Yankees won it 4-1 to one behind Catfish Hunter. Hunter beat Larry Gura. 
Then on Saturday night in Kansas City, the Royals came back and won it 7 to 3. Paul Splittor pitching good relief pitch, uh, relief baseball. He won it over Ed Figueroa. So the tier series was tied up at one apiece when they came back to New York for a night game on Tuesday, and the Yankees won that one 5 to 3 as Doc Ellis beat Andy Hassler. Then last night, the Royals came right back and beat the Yankees 7 to 4 here in New York with Doug Bird coming out of the bullpen and winning that ball game and Catfish Hunter the loser. So the Cat, so far in the series, has won one and lost one. Doc Ellis has won one, lost none for the Yankees. For the Royals, Splitdorf has won one, lost none. And Doug Bird has won one and lost none. The losing pitchers, Larry Girl, 0-1 for the Royals. And Ed Figueroa, 0-1 for the New York Yankees. So this is it, fifth and final game. Series tied at two apiece. Littell now is finished. And Willie Randolph steps in. Yankees have six runs on ten hits. The Royals three runs on seven base hits. Each team has made an error. We're playing the bottom of the seventh. Nettles off second base with two outs. As Littell sets. And the first pitch to Randolph. Fastball is up and in a ball. Well, he's fly to right field. He's lined to first base and he's walked. He's 0 for 2. Steve Mingori, a left-hander, gets up and starts loosening up for the Royals. Patel sets again. And the 1-0 pitch. Bounce up the middle to his left and charging his pot tech. Flips on the first base. They've got Randolph. Moving to third base is Greg Nettles. So there are two outs. And the batter is Fred Stanley. Stanley has bounced to third. He's walked and he's lined to second. So he's 0 for 2. Fred was a 238 hitter on the year for the Yankees. He's 5 for 14 in the series. And here's the first pitch to him. Inside a ball. Looking ahead for the Royals. They'll have the top of their batting order up against Figueroa in the top of the eighth. Cowens, Poquette, and Brett. Mattel takes a long look for the sign. Now the right-hander sets. And the pitch. Swung on. Loop to right field. Coming on is McRae. Still coming, and he's got it on the run. Al McRae, charging all the way, made the catch in shallow right for out number three. The Yankees, no runs, no hits, a walk, and a man left on base. We played seven, and at the end of seven, it's the Yankees six, the Royals three. Fairchild has designed a new digital timepiece just because. Truly slim and uniquely designed with her in mind, it tells the hour, minute, seconds, month, and date, all at the touch of a button. It may not be her birthday or your anniversary, but just because. Just because she is that special person. So why not surprise her with a digital timepiece from Fairchild? Pick the Fairchild that fits her best. Because. That Amco is big. The world's biggest transmission specialist. With over 525 service centers in the U.S. of A. and Canada. So no matter where you go, from New York to L.A., from Ontario to Texas, Amco's got you covered. Nobody else is that big. Nobody. So if you have trouble with your car's transmission, you can usually get one-day service from Amco Transmissions. Double A. MCO. The big guys. Well, we're in the top of the eighth. The Yankees lead 6-3, to three, and Al Cowens, Tom Poquette, and George Brett are due for the Kansas City Royals. Cowens is 0-4 so far. Check that 0-3. Hasn't gotten the ball out of the infield. Bounced out twice a second and bounced to short. Bounced into a double play in the fifth.
so far Figueroa has scattered seven base hits gave up two hits in the first two innings two in the first two in the second for a total of four then he retired eight in a row before Martinez got a base hit in the fifth a single then Cowan's bounced into the double play Mayberry got a single off the wall in right field in the sixth and Patek got a single off Nettles glove in the seventh well here's Cowan's and he takes up and in a ball They play Cowan straight away. Here's Figueroa's next pitch. Fouled straight back up on the screen. A ball and a strike. Had three crowds of over 56,000 here at the stadium for the three games. Figueroa now with a new baseball. Rocks, kicks, and deals a 1-1 pitch. Line, pass, Nettles, base hit left field. White over in the corner comes up with the ball, and Cowens has to hold at first base. And here comes Billy Martin. Now Cowens jumping on a high pitch and slamming it to left field for base hit. Martin out. He weighed with his left hand. He must want Grant Jackson. And it's going to be Grant Jackson. Listen to the hand for Ed Figueroa. So Ed Figueroa leaves and Grant Jackson is coming on. And it looks like the Royals are going to make a change. They bring back Poquette. And they're going to send up a right-handed batter, Jim Wolford. So Figueroa leaves. He went seven innings. He pitched to one man here in the eighth. Gave up three runs on eight base hits. He struck out three and did not walk a batter. And he got quite a hand as he left. They keep talking about Figueroa and how he was a stopper last year for the California Angels and pitched such great baseball for the Yankees here in 1976. Ended up 19 wins, 10 losses. And he missed a couple of times for his 20th and then got rained out the final time on the Sunday in the final game of the year with the Cleveland Indians. But Figueroa has got to be satisfied with what he's accomplished here in 1976. So he leaves with the Yankees up 6-3 over the Royals, and Grant Jackson comes on. Jackson's making his second appearance in the series for the Yankees. He pitched here yesterday afternoon. Pitched two and a third innings, gave up one run on two base hits. He struck out two and walked one. Jackson normally has excellent control. I've got a lot of conferences going on. Nettles talking to Chuck Hiller, the Royal third base coach. The Yankee outfielders, White, Rivers, and Gamble to gather out there in center field. And Bill Haller, the second base umpire. We're talking to uh, that Joe Brinkman, the second base umpire. Actually, Haller is the umpire down the left field foul line. He goes back over there. Oh, well, Jim Wolford comes on to bat for Tom Poquette with a runner at first base and nobody out in the eighth inning. The Yankees leading 6-3 to three over the Royals. Wolford takes a strike. <laughs> Wolford takes a strike. 
Jackson works quickly. This is high. One ball, one strike. Wolford's been up nine times. He has one base hit. Here's a 1-1 pitch to him. Swung on and missed. The ball and two strikes. On deck, the third baseman, George Brett. Jackson straight and sets at the belt. Checks the runner and the 1-2. Fouled straight back to the screen. Count remains. The ball, two strikes on Jim Wolford. Yankees set up looking for two, except for Chambliss. He's holding Cowens there at first base. And Jackson exchanges baseball with home plate umpire Art France. Now Chambliss will play behind Cowens at first base. The Royals down three. Chambliss does not think Cowens might move towards second. Here's a one-two. Curveball is high. Two balls, two strikes. Sparky Lyle and Dick Tidrow warming in the Yankee bullpen. Jackson sets. And the 2-2 pitch. Low. Three balls, two strikes. Now Jackson ready again. Here's the 3-2 pitch. Line center field. River started back. Now he's coming on. He can't get to it. Base hit. Throw in the second base will not be in time. Rivers took just one step back. He couldn't have gotten to that ball anyway. It was a broken bat looper in the center field. He decoyed Cowens a bit. Threw it in the second, but Cowens on safe there. So a broken bat single in the center field by Jim Wolford. And the tying run now is at the plate. That's George Brett. Cowens down at second. Brett on at first. Check that Wolford on it first, and Brett's a batter. Brett is doubled and scored. He's fly to center field, and he's lined to center field. One for three. And on deck is John Mayberry. And these Royals do not give up. They keep fighting. They don't hit the long ball too often, but they get the bat on the ball. As Jackson sets and checks the runners. The pitch is high. Cowens moving off second. Wolford off first. Here's the 1-0 to Brett. Swung on it down the right field line. That ball is going to be trouble. It is gone. A home run for George Brett. We've got a tie ball game. Brett hit one right down the right field line. About 10 rows back in the lower deck. Cowan scores. Wolford scores. And now Brett scores. And the tie... The scores, the Yankees six and the Royals six. Well, that's the Royals' second home run of the series. This fella, John Mayberry, hit their first in the first inning with a man on. The Yankees swing their infield and their outfield around toward the right side now for Mayberry. And the curveball is over his head. Mayberry is in a two-run homer. He's bounced a second, and he's single to right field. So he's two for three. One swing of the bat, and the ball game is all tied up. Here's the 1-0. Breaking ball is on the inside corner. It's one and one. On deck is Hal McCray. Here's the 1-1 pitch to Mayberry. Swung on and missed. Mayberry trying for another home run. It's one and two. Here's a one-two pitch to Mayberry. Swung on, pop straight back. It'll be up on the screen. No play for much. Well, the Royals here in the eighth inning got a leadoff single by Al Cowens. That got rid of Figueroa. Jackson came on. Wolford batted for Poquette at a broken bat single to center. Then George Brett homered. A three-run shot. We've got a tie game. Fastball just misses inside. Two balls, two strikes on Mayberry. Tidrow and Lyle still loosening up in the Yankee bullpen. Here's a 2-2 pitch. Curveball is fouled back. 
And the count remains two and two. The Yankees have Stanley up behind second base Randolph playing a deep second. And Chambliss back on the grass at first on the outfield grass. Here's a 2-2 pitch to Mayberry. Fastball, Texas wing, bounces at the second. Randolph there, gobbles it up, flips on the Chambliss, and there's one away. So with one out, nobody on, that'll bring on Hal McCray, the right fielder. McCray has struck out. He's popped the Chambliss at first base, and he's bounced back to the mound. He's 0 for 3. Yankees in the bottom of this inning will have Rivers, White, and Mutson against Mark Littell. First pitch to Mac Ray. Takes outside a ball. On deck is Jamie Quirk. He might be called back, though. He's a left-handed hitter. High two balls, no strikes on Mac Ray. Here's a 2-0. High ball three. Three balls, no strikes. One out, nobody on. Scores tied. Yankees six, Royals six. We're playing the top half of the eighth inning. McRae backs out a couple of times. Now he gets back in. Here's a 3-1 to him. Swung on, hit deep to left, but White's there. Backing up, he's got it. Two outs. McRae backed out, wanted to get the green light. Got it, hit the ball hard, but right to Roy White. So there are two outs now. Still nobody on. George Brett took care of that with the three-run home run. The batter will be Jamie Quirk, who's fly to left, bounced a short line to the first baseman, Chambliss. Quirk is 0 for 3. Moving on deck is Cookie Rojas. Curveball is a strike. Now Jackson rocks. Here's the one strike pitch. Breaking ball is swung on and missed. No balls, two strikes. George Brett tied this ball game up with a three-run home run. He got it all. When he hit it, he jumped. He knew he'd got it. Here's a two-strike pitch. Inside, backs him off. A ball and two strikes. Jackson looking in. Now the one-two. Curveball is swung on a miss. Quirk goes down swinging for the third off. But the Royals pick up three runs on the three-run home run by George Brett, and they tie the ball game. We're going to the bottom of the eighth. Scores all tied. Yankees six, the Kansas City Royals six. Hi, this is Dick Clark. May I get personal with you for a minute? You know, even if you shower twice a day, you can't wash away jock itch. What you need is something made specifically for jock itch, and that's Cruex, C-R-U-E-X. Cruex medicated powder relieves the itching, the chafing, the rash. And because it's medicated, it can fight the cause of that itch. So if you suffer from chafing, rash, or jock itch, get Cruex, C-R-U-E-X, and get relief. If all you need is money, come on into HFC. College can bring a lot of unexpected expenses. And if it does, come on in to Household Finance. We'll do everything we can to lend you the extra money you need. HFC, an equal opportunity lender. So come on in. Come on in. Come on in to HFC. Household Finance, where people use our money to get the most out of life. Come on in to HFC. Now Jim Wolford, who got that key single, a broken bat single in the center field just ahead of George Brett's home run, stays in the ball game, and he'll play left field. So the Royals have Wolford in left. They've got Cowens in center, and they've got Hal McRae out in right field. Infield still the same. Brett at third. Patek the shortstop. Rojas at second base, and Mayberry at first. Martinez catching. And the fifth pitcher, pitcher used by and uh, by Whitey Herzog. Mark Littell is still on the mound. Leonard started. Splitthorpe came out on the first. Patton in the fourth. Hassler in the fifth. Littell came on the last inning. 
Here's Mickey Rivers. He's four for four. A triple and three singles, three runs scored. And the first pitch to Mickey. Fastball tails away, a ball. Rivers is eight for 22 in the series. Brett way in at third base on the grass. Fastball is high, two balls, no strikes. Well, Doug Bird, a right-hander, and Steve Mingori, a left-hander, are warming up in the Royal bullpen. Leading on deck is Roy White. Here's a 2-0 to Rivers. He fakes a bunt, takes a strike. It's 2-1. and one. Big gap for Mickey in a right center field. They've got Wolford over there the line playing shallow and left. They've got Cowens over toward left center. McRae straight away and right. Here's a 2-1 to Rivers. Hit in the air, right field. Going back is McRae. He's got room. Waiting. He's got it. Oh, Rivers goes out for the first time in the ball game. A fly ball to the right fielder, Al McRae. That'll bring on Roy White. White's batting a left-handed against Littell. Roy has only been at bat officially once in the ball game when he beat out a single to deep short, scoring Rivers in the first inning. He also scored after stealing a base. He walked and scored in the third, walked again in the fourth, and uh, sacrificed in the sixth. So he's one for one. Yankees six and the Royals six, playing the bottom half of the eighth inning. One out, nobody on. <laughs> it's a barn burner. First pitch is hit one hopper and gobbled up by Mayberry, and he'll take it himself at first base. There are two outs. Tough play for Mayberry. Short hopper. He stayed in front of it. Picked it clean. Got his man. So with two outs, nobody on. That'll bring on Thurm Munson. Munson's had a great series. He has 10 hits and 22 times at bat. He and Chambles each have 10 hits. That's a new championship series record for base hits. Munson has singled three times in this ball game. He's driven in two runs. He's also flied to left field. He straightened up for Munson. Tidro now gets up and starts warming up in the Yankee bullpen. Here's the first pitch to Thurman. Best ball is swung on and missed. The Royals will have all right-handers batting in the bottom half of the ninth inning, so we might get Tidro in. They'll have Rojas, Patek, and Martinez. Art France looks at that baseball, and he'll throw it out. Littell will get a new baseball. Of course, Herzog might go with his left-hander Mingori in the bottom of the ninth, no matter what Littell does here in the eighth, because the Yankees will have Chambliss, Alomar, a pinch hit, of course, for Alomar, Nettles and Gamble do in. The one-strike pitch, swung on and missed. Two strikes on Munson. Thurm trying to hit the ball out. McRae deep in right field. Cowens deep in center. Here's a two-strike pitch. Breaking ball is low. One ball, two strikes. Martinez thought it was a strike. A ball and two strikes on much. Now Latell goes on the backside of the mound, goes to the mouth. Now back up top looking in for Sun. He winds, and here's the one-two pitch. Swung on, fouled straight back and out of play. The count remains, the ball and two strikes. Well, nobody's gone home here. All these seats are still full. We're in the bottom half of the eighth inning. Two outs and nobody on. And the scoreboard's the same. The Yankees have six runs on, ten hits have made an error. The Royals also have six runs on, ten hits, and they've made an error. Here's the one, two to Munson. Swung on and missed. Thurman goes down swinging on a good sinker. No runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left on base. We played eight. 
And at the end of eight, the score's tied. The Yankees six, the Kansas City Royals six. I want a beer like no other beer. I'm shaped for people. I want flavor that won't disappear. I'm shaped for people. Consistency makes a great beer. And Schaefer's consistently great tasting every single time because Schaefer's brewed the old world way. Croisoning, we call it. Since 1842, Croisoning, the extra step of brewing twice, has kept Schaefer consistently fresh and crisp, consistently great tasting, beer after Schaefer beer. I want a beer like no other beer. I'm Schaefer people. I want flavor that won't disappear. I'm Schaefer people. Well, Dick Tidrow will come on and pitch for the Yankees in the top of the ninth. Oh, Jackson's record is complete along with Figueroa's. Figueroa went seven, gave up four runs as he was charged with Cowan's run on eight base hits. Figueroa struck out three and didn't walk anybody. Jackson pitched one inning. Gave up two runs on two base hits. He didn't walk anybody and he struck out one. Oh, now it's up to Dick Tidrow and Mark Littell. Now, this has been a seesaw ball game. The Royals took a 2-0 lead in the top of the first on a home run by John Mayberry. The Yankees came back in the bottom of the first with two to tie it. The Royals scored one to go ahead in the top of the second. They went ahead 3-2. Yankees came right back with two in the bottom half of the third to go ahead 4-3. Then the Yankees got a couple insurance runs in the sixth to make it 6-3 to three. but the Royals in the 8th inning used a single by Collins a pinch single by Wolford and a 3 run home run by George Brett to tie the ball game up so we're going into the ninth inning now and we've got a 6-6 tie and it'll be Rojas Patek and Martinez due for the Kansas City Royals against Dick Tidrow Tidro pitched Sunday night in Kansas City. Went two and two-thirds innings. Gave up uh, three runs on three hits. He also pitched Wednesday afternoon three and two-thirds innings. Rojas hits a one-hopper to Stanley. He's right there at shortstop. Straight and throws on the first. They've got Rojas. And there's one away. So Tidro is making his third relief appearance in the championship series. Here's Freddie Patek. Patek has struck out fouled out and got an infield hit. He's hit in all five games. He's one for three. And a seven for 17 in the series. Neto shortens up at third base and he guards the line a bit. Outfield playing Patek straight away. And the first pitch is low. Yankees in the bottom of this inning will have Chambliss, Alomar, and Greg Nettles do against Mark Littell. Strike. Fastball had just got the outside corner. One ball, one strike on Patek. Tidrow looks for a sign. Now he's ready and the 1 1 pitch. Fouled straight back and off the mask of Munson. The ball and two strikes. Tidrow taking a lot of time out on the mound. Now he gets his son. Here's a 1-2 pitch to Patek. Chopped foul outside a third. He broke his bat. So he'll need some new lumber. 
Tidrow jammed him with a fastball. It tailed down and in. Fottek trying to get out front. Got hit on the fist and pulled the ball foul and broke his back. Let's take 15 seconds for station identification on the New York Yankee Home of Champions Radio Network. This is WMCA Strauss Communications in New York. Hi, I'm John Sterling, and sports is a big part of Real People Radio. Real people like Thurman Munson, Dr. J. Julia Serving, and Dennis Potvin. WMCA Sports for all seasons. Oh, Patek has a new bat, and he's back in. Tidrow getting a new sign, and he takes so long that Patek calls time and backs off. One out, nobody on. Ninth inning, scores tied. Yankees six, the Kansas City Royals six. To count a ball and two strikes on Fred Patek. And the pitch. Swung on, fouled back again. That got Munson again on the mask. We're on a shoulder. And that hurts. Munson hit on... No, oh, he got him in the cheek, uh, in, the, in the neck. Martin not quickly. And here comes Gene Monahan, the Yankee trainer. He's hustling out. That's the worst place a catcher can get hit. Might have got him on the breastbone, though, instead of the neck. Martin out there along with Gene Monahan, Dick Tidrow, Chambliss in there along with Nettles, and Potek bending down. They're all looking at Munson. And Thurm now will get up off his knee, gets up off his knees. Oh, Thurman gets a hand. The count is still a ball and two strikes on Patek. With one out, nobody on. Ninth inning, Yankees six, Royals six. Down to the wire. Tedrow now cleaning the dirt out of his spikes as he goes back up top of the mound. Now the big right-hander looks for a sign. Makes a big sigh. Now the one-two pitch to Patek. Low, two balls, two strikes. Well, Alexander's up in the Yankee bullpen along with Sparky Lyle. Alexander has not gotten into the ball game, a ball game, nor has Kenny Holtzman. Here's a two-two pitch now. Swung on, hit on a ground, a shortstop. Stanley digs it out. He's got to hurry in time at first base by half a step. Two outs. And the batter's a catcher, Buck Martinez. In fact, Alexander and uh, Gidry and Holtzman. The only pitchers not used by the Yankees. Gidry did get into a ball game as a pinch runner. As Buck Martinez steps in. Martinez is two for three. And here's the first pitch to him. Swung on line. Base hit left center field. Over quickly is White Rivers. They'll get it in quickly. Martinez with not much speed. He'll have to hold at first base. So Martinez is three for four. He's on at first base with two outs. And that'll bring on Al Cowens, the center fielder. Cowens is one for four. He's grounded to Randolph twice at second base. He's bounced into a double play. And he's singled to left field. He started the trouble in the eighth inning with a single to left. That got rid of Figueroa. Brought on Jackson. Gave up the uh, pitch single to Jim Wolford. And the home run to Brett. That's why it's tied 6-6. Here's the pitch to Cowens. Low a ball. set again by Ted Rowe. He checks Martinez at first. The 1-0 pitch. Low again. Two balls, no strikes. On deck is Jim Wolford. (laughs) 
Now Steve Boros, the first base coach, says something to Buck Martinez at first. Martinez does not take a big lead. And Tidro backs off. Martinez goes back to first, and Cowens backs out of the box. And Tidro wants another sign from Munson. They move Nettles just off the third baseline, maybe a step. As Tidro sets. The 2-0 pitch. Inside ball, three. Three balls, no strikes. Now the Yankees and Tidro in danger of getting that tying run down at second base. Now Tidro is ready. And the 3-0 to Cowan. Call strike on the inside corner. It's three and one. Now Tidro is ready. And the three one pitch. Low ball four. Cowens walks. And the tying the go ahead run now is down at second. Here comes Martin out of the dugout. Martinez now, remember, does not have that much speed. And Herzog just finished talking to his third base coach, Chuck Hiller, and he's telling uh, Hiller's going to go out and tell Martinez to get a bigger lead. Buck does not run that well, and if he takes that short lead, of course, in case the uh, Wolford gets a base hit, and Wolford really doesn't sing the ball that hard or that far, he wants uh, Martinez with a good lead and a chance to score. The Yankee outfielder short enough for Wolford. Royals have runners at first and second. Martinez down at second. Cowan's on at first. There are two outs, and the batter is Jim Wolford, who is single to center as a pinch hitter in the eighth inning. Right-handed batter. Pitch to him. Low a ball. And on deck is George Brett. They like to get away from here without allowing Brett Mayberry to hit here in the ninth inning. Here's a 1-0 now to Wolford. Pop foul out of play right side. That's a ball and a strike. <laughs> Rivers playing a shallow center field and Gamble with an excellent arm playing a shallow right field. As Tidrow sets and checks the runners. Here's a 1-1 pitch. Inside, two balls and a strike. Yankees six, Royals six playing the ninth inning. Royals have the go-ahead run down at second base with two outs. That's Martinez down at second. Cowan's on at first. Here's a 2-1 pitch. High chopper, Nettles in front, comes up, throws the second. They get the force on Cowan's there and the side is retired. Greg Nettles being aggressive, charged in front of Stanley. Flip that ball to second base just in time to get a sliding out count. No runs on a base hit. Two men left on base. Yankees up bottom of the ninth. Scores tied. Yankees six, Royals six. We're Household Finance. And last year, we helped over 2 million people get the most out of life. Whether it was a dream vacation, a snowmobile, or a stereo. That's why we're here. HFC, an equal opportunity lender. Come, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Hey, HFC. Household Finance, where people use our money to get the most out of life. Come on in to HFC. Who's on first in mozzarella and ricotta? Palio, that's who. Palio is the first in mozzarella and ricotta cheese because Palio is the last word in quality and purity. Flavor, too, because the authentic Italian taste of Palio mozzarella and ricotta makes a delicious difference in dishes Italiano. Take the guesswork out of cooking Italian style. Go with the best sellers in Italian soft cheese. Creamy smooth Palio ricotta and easy slicing fast melting Palio mozzarella. At your favorite market now. Get to know Palio. Well, the hand is building up for Chris Chambliss as Mark Littell is still in the ball game and he'll pitch to Chambliss. And Alomar's on deck. And uh, then Greg Nettles. Chambliss has had some kind of championship series. He's been up 20 times. 
He has 10 base hits. He's driven in seven runs. He scored four runs. He's stolen two bases. He's hit a double, a triple, and a home run. And he's batting 500. So he's in against the right-hander Mark Littell here in the bottom half of the ninth inning. Rod Hendricks has a bat walking around the Yankee dugout, so he'll probably be sent in the bat for Sandy Alomar. As we wait for Hal McRae to give the ground crew some debris out there in right field. Tell takes advantage of that little lull why Moal McRae does a lot of house cleaning out there to get some extra warm up throws in. Those look like bottles being thrown around out there. Somebody can get hurt. And we would hope that if anybody, any of the fans, have a radio up in that upper deck, they will please stop people from throwing bottles down on the field or throwing anything on the field. No sense marring a series game with someone getting hurt. Now the umpires are going to get together and I'm sure that we're going to get an announcement from Bob Shepard. Is that uh, Ducky Medwick of the Dodgers in Detroit? Ducky was with the Cardinals then. Had to be taken out by the commissioner. People throwing debris all over the place. And have talked to Billy Martin. Billy's going to have Bob Shepard make the announcement for fans to please be good sports and not endanger other fans and players on both teams with thrown objects. And here's the announcement from Bob Shepard. waiting for Chris Chambliss as the Yankee ground crew, which has done an excellent job all year long. Jimmy Esposito and his group and keeping this field in good shape. They played football here. They've had a boxing match here. I think they played soccer here. They've had a religious group here. But this field still is in very good shape. And it's a tribute to Jimmy Esposito and his ground crew. Well, they're finished now as Chambliss starts up. Chris drove in a run with a sacrifice fly in the first. Drove in another one with a bounce out in the third. Double to right center, but was left stranded in the fifth. Single to center in the sixth. Stole a second base and scored when Brett threw wild to first base in that sixth inning. Chambliss has had some kind of series. He's gotten some big hits all year long for the Yankees. And he's in now against the right-hander, Mark Littell. And here's the first pitch. Hit deep to right field. That ball is up against the wall. It's gone. A home run for Chris Tamlis, and this championship series is over. Look at those fans out on the field. Somebody picked up second base. Somebody just knocked Tamlis down. He's making it to third. These fans are all over the field trying to let you, and the cops are out trying to let Chambliss score. And Chambliss running through the crowd. Hey, he has not touched home plate. Chambliss hasn't touched home plate yet. Fans are 
Rogers are out on the field. Fans are all over the field. Chambliss had to work his way all the way around the field from second base. After he touched first, fans out on the field pulled second base up. Somebody pulled third base up. They're down there now trying to take up home plate. And Chandler still has not touched home plate. And the ball game, I think, is over. Chris Chandler is jumping on the first pitch from Mark Mattel. Hitting it over the wall at the 353 mark. Hal McCray gave it a good shot. But the ball was out of reach. And the Yankees win it by a score of 7-6. to six. And I'll be back with a wrap-up right after this. Sure is easy to say yes to the affordable Chrysler Cordova any time of the year. But right now, it's the end of the model year. And that means you can get a clearance deal on a luxurious Cordova. Sound good to you? Yes. Yes. It's the time to say yes. And your Chrysler Plymouth dealer. And Cordova is one personal midsize luxury car that has a lot going for it, like many standard luxuries. No wonder Cordova is the most successful Chrysler ever introduced. And right now, you can get a clearance deal that'll put you behind the wheel of a luxurious Chrysler Cordova. Yes. Get your year-end clearance deal at your local Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Yes! Well, I tell you, fans are all over that field out there. It's the Yankees. Behind Chris Chambliss who jumped on the first pitch for Mark Littell after we had to wait a while while the field was cleared of debris and bottles thrown out on the field. Littell's first pitch was hit by Chambliss over the right center field wall, and the Yankees won it by a score of 7-6. to six. Both teams played excellent baseball. Both teams played hard. You got you to gotta feel a little bit for the Kansas City Royals. They came in here without Steve Busby, their best pitcher over the years. Paul Splitthorpe had missed him much of the year. They lost Amos Otis in the first game against Catfish Hunter when he tried to beat out a button and severely strained an ankle. He didn't play the rest of the series. And you also got to take your hats off to the Yankees. They were down 2-0 in this final game. Came back and tied it up in the bottom of the first 2-2. Royals went ahead 3-2 in the second. Yankees back with two more in the bottom of the sixth to go ahead 4-3. The Royals came right back, a three-run home run by George Brett in the eighth. The tied up at six apiece. Then in the bottom of the ninth, Chris Chambliss. One swing of the bat. And the New York Yankees are the 1976 American League champions on the home run by Chris Chambliss leading off the ninth inning. The Yankees had seven runs on ten hits in error. The Royals, six runs on the 11 base hits. And they made one error. The winning pitcher for the New York Yankees, Dick Tidrow in relief. The losing pitcher, Mark Littell of the Kansas City Royals. And we're going to have the Getty Series player. And there's only one guy who's going to get that. The most valuable player this year in the American League Championship Series has to be Chris Chambliss. Chambliss was up 21 times. He set a new record with 11 base hits. Of those 11 base hits, he got a double, a triple, and two home runs. He scored five runs, and he also drove in eight runs. In addition to that, he stole two bases. So the Getty player of the series is Chris Chambliss of the New York Yankees. On the final, once again, the Yankees, seven runs on 10 hits, one error. The Royals, six runs on 11 hits. They also made an error. And the New York Yankees are the 1976 American League champions.
The executive producer of Yankee Baseball is Mike DiTomaso. The associate producer is Ben uh, Enos Carnes II. Our engineer has been Dan Bartolucci. Lines and network facilities were arranged by the Robert Wall Company. Well, this is it. I'm Bill White for Frank Messer and for the scooter, Phil Rizzuto, for Dan Bartolucci, for everybody over at Manchester Broadcasting, and for everybody associated with the New York Yankees. It's been some kind of year. And we'll see you next year. Final score once again, the New York Yankees are the 1976 American League champions. The final score, the Yankees 7 and the Kansas City Royals 6. Today's game has been brought to you by Chrysler Plymouth. It's the year to say yes to Motor Trend's Car of the Year, Chrysler Plymouth Volari. By Gabriel. No matter what you drive, no matter how you drive, there's a Gabriel shock for you. Gabriel, King of the Road. By Colonial Yankee Friends. This is Mel Allen speaking to you from a Yankee stadium that, if I can find the words to yell over this microphone and over the crowd, there are literally some five to seven or eight thousand people jamming the field here at Yankee Stadium and still yelling with signs saying, yes, we did. We're number one on the electric scoreboard as the Yankees and one of the most fantastic finishes I've ever seen in the history of baseball beat our rugged Royals team 7-6 to six to win the American League championship. Once again, Yankee Stadium is the home of champions. And in a moment, we hope to bring you some of the dressing room action. All brought to you by Getty Premium and new Getty Unleaded Regular. The higher octane gasolines for the lower prices. In the best three out of five division playoff for the American League title, the Yankees won the opener in Kansas City 4-1. With Catfish Hunter the winner and Larry Gurer the loser. Only to see Kansas City come back to win the second game, 7-3. to three. Spittorf got the win. Leonard had started and Figueroa, who started tonight, was the losing pitcher. And then the scene shifted to Yankee Stadium. And you can hear the multitude in the background roaring, happy. The first title ever to come back to Yankee Stadium after the great dynasty that lasted so many years since 1964. And in game three, the Yankees moved ahead in games two to one with a five to three win over Kansas City. A game that Doc Ellis got the victory in. And the loser was Andy Hassler. Only to see Kansas City come back in game four yesterday. And when it's 7-4 to four to tie it up at 2-all, Gura started the ball game. Bird in relief got the win, and Hunter was charged with a loss. And then tonight, Ed Figueroa, who had won 19 games during the year for the Yankees, started and pitched magnificent ball, although in the very first inning, his mound opponent, by the way, was Dennis Leonard, with two out, gave up a double to Brett and a home run to Mayberry. And the Royals were off to a quick two to nothing lead, but the Yankees struck back as Rivers tripled. White beat out an infield hit, stole second and rode home on Munson single, and it was a two all ball game. The Royals went ahead three to two in the second inning on a single, a stolen base, 
by Rojas and a single by Martinez. But the Yankees moved ahead four to three in the third inning in a seesaw struggle. A Bronx brawl it was. And once again it was Mickey Rivers who got on base his first four times up and started every Yankee rally as he singled the center and White walked. And Munson came up to bat and Patton came in to relieve as Whitey Herzog used about five pitchers and Munson got a base hit. An infield out, got the second run in, and the Yankees led four to three at the end of three innings. Meantime, Figueroa had begun to settle down, and the Royals could do nothing with him. Inning after inning, from the third inning through the eighth, while the Yankees, meantime, built up a six to three lead with two runs in the sixth inning, started once again by Mickey Rivers, beating out a bunt, sacrificed the second by White. Then came a base hit by Munson. And Chambliss got a base hit. And an error. And the Yankees had themselves two runs, a 6-3 to three lead. And things looked pretty good. Until suddenly, in the eighth inning, Figueroa, who had tired, gave up a single to leadoff man Al Collins. Billy Martin took him out and brought in Grant Jackson, who gave up a single to Walford and then Brett hit a home run into the right field seats. Two homers accounting for five of the Royals runs and it was a 6-6 ball game. And so we came to the last half of the ninth inning. Chris Chambliss was the first man to bat and the right-hander after Patton and Haster had come in on the mound, Mark Littell got ready to pitch. Time was called for till they cleared the field for a little while. Some people had thrown something on the field. And on the first pitch, Chambliss swung and hit a fantastic, soaring, beautiful, sensational drive over the 385 mark for a home run that gave the Yankees not only victory, but the American League champion as ship and on the electric sign on the scoreboard it still is showing New York Yankees 1976 American League champions the totals the Yankees seven runs 11 hits in one era the Royals six runs 11 hits in one era and shortly we'll go down to the dressing room where John Sterling hopes to get some of the players and people on the air but first of all, let's have this word from our sponsor, Getty Premium. If you buy unleaded gasoline, you may have noticed that lead isn't the only thing missing. It's probably pretty low on performance, too. That's because most unleaded's just don't have a high enough octane rating to give you the performance you want, the performance you used to get from your regular. In fact, according to standards set by the American Society for Testing and Materials, the people who set gasoline standards used by the federal and state governments, only three unleaded gasolines have a high enough octane to be called regular. To help you choose between these three, one of them usually sells for less. Getty. Getty unleaded regular gives you the clean running engine you expect from an unleaded, plus the octane performance you want. And you pay less than you would for most other major unleaded. Now think a minute. Why settle for an unleaded gasoline that's below regular when you can get one that's regular? Getty Unleaded Regular. Once again, we've got what's best for your car. This is WMCA Strauss Communications in New York. Hi, I'm John Sterling, and I've got sports for you. New York Yankees baseball, New York Nets basketball, New York Islanders hockey, NFL football, Notre Dame football, New York, New Jersey college basketball. WMCA, sports for all seasons. This is Mel Allen speaking to you again from Yankee Stadium, and you can hear in the background the roar of the crowd. What a ball game. Seven to six Yankees. The Yankees champions of the American League for the first time since 1964. It's been a long drought. 
But the fans are really eating it up now. And this whole ball game was simply a rip-roaring, rousing battle between two great teams, the Kansas City Royals and the New York Yankees. A power-packed payoff with Chris Chambliss slamming the first pitch over the right center field fence in the last half of the ninth inning to give the Yankees their 7-6 to six well-deserved victory and American League championship. Thousands are still out on the field as the Yankees won their 30th American League pennant. 20 of which I have been fortunate enough to have been privy to. But never have I seen a crowd like this. Most of the tremendous crowd that was here, the largest of the season at New Yankee Stadium, have departed. But there still remain some 5,000 people yelling. They're all over the infield and the outfield. They're yelling, we're number one. And they're yelling, now think series. Just listen to them in the background. Well, after 12 years, you can't blame them. The Yankees' 30th American League pennant win. And so it'll be the Yankees against the Cincinnati Reds when the World Series opens on Saturday. Bedlam has broken loose at Yankee Stadium. And I'm sure it's that way downstairs in the dressing room. John Sterling fighting and clawing his way, trying to get someone on the microphone to interview. A little while earlier, we had the opportunity to shake the hand of George Steinbrenner, owner of the New York Yankees, and Gabe Paul, their president, and Cedric Ta uh, Tallis, the vice president. Our congratulations to them and to Billy Martin, who as a player we had the privilege of watching assist in winning many a pennant here at Yankee Stadium. In his first year as a manager of the Yankees, his first full year, he directed the Yankees to this championship that ended in a manner that reminded you of Bobby Thompson's home run that gave the Giants the victory. The home run that they say was heard around the world. Described by the late Russ Hodges, who worked with us for a long while before moving to the Giants. And this was very much like it. All of a sudden, an explosion. And boy, that set off an explosion to this crowd of nearly 57,000 people. And thousands are still on the field. But they're gradually starting to leave very slowly. But it was a ball game that will remember, be remembered by them, by all of us who were here. And be remembered by Bill White and Phil Rizzuto and Frank Messer. As long as they live, all the writers who were here, this is one of those games of all the thousands that have been played in the history of Major League Baseball that they will be talking and writing about in the years to come. What a fitting finish to the 75th year of the American League. The 1976 American League pennant was on the line tonight. And how these two teams scrapped. Each team scoring two runs in the first inning. The Royals moving ahead three to two in the second. The Yankees coming back to move ahead four to three at the end of three. And then six to three at the end of six. And suddenly a three-run homer in the eighth inning by George Brett. Tied it up at six all. It put a damper on the crowd. But Chris Chambliss who has done it so many times this season, getting a key hit to win a ball game, crashed the first pitch served to him by Mark Littell. It wasn't just a home run. It wasn't just a base hit. It wasn't just another honor for Chris Chambliss. He brought honor to the entire Yankee organization. He brought home a championship. 
to the home of champions. The official paid attendance, 56,821. All that they could pack in here. And of course, there will be hundreds of thousands in the years to come who, in recounting this magnificent, exciting game, will say that they were here. That's human nature. But what a ball game. I'm still excited, as you can uh, hear. It's hard to remember a game to equal this one. Unless I think back to a World Series when the Yankees lost one. When Mazeroski hit the home run in the last of the ninth inning for Pittsburgh to beat the Yankees in the seventh game of the World Series. And how the Pittsburgh crowd exploded. But it gives me an opportunity as I pause for a moment to congratulate Mr. George Steinbrenner, Mr. Gabe Paul, and all the members of the Yankee organization for bringing back to Yankee Stadium not only a pennant, but fans who once again simply exploded just as Chris Shambliss exploded as I think back during the course of this season many a time they would stand up and give ovations the time that they gave an ovation to Doyle Alexander who had a no hitter going into the ninth inning made him come out and take a bow even though he didn't pitch the no hitter after he was taken out after a base hit it showed that these fans, everybody loves a winner, but these fans, even throughout the season, were most appreciative of all the efforts on the part of the Yankee organization to bring an exciting team back here to Yankee Stadium. And that they did. Gabe Paul making some wonderful trades, some that people didn't think were very good, but trades that turned out beautifully. And now I understand that John Sterling has finally made his way down to the locker room. So, John, if you're ready, take it away. Well, I'm down here in the uh, tunnel between the Yankee uh, clubhouse and the interview room, and I have the big old Oscar Gamble here. And First year with the team, Oscar, and you win the pennant, the ninth inning of the last game, and it's got to be the wildest, most dramatic, exciting feeling I guess you had in baseball. This is the best feeling I've ever had in baseball. I'm just exhausted. It was great. It was great. Well, you, you guys are down right away, and Rivers gets on base like he had to. He got on four straight times of hits. You get back, you lead, Brett ties it up. Did you have any feeling about Chambliss in the ninth inning? Well, yes, you know, I know we had three left handers coming up, and I figured, you know, that he'd be trying to get ahead of Chambers, and he hit the first pitch out of it. It's just, you know, just excited. One big hit after another. You had 17 homers this year, 15 in this ballpark. you got to love playing here. Well, yes, you know, I thought they were going to start a left hander tonight, and I was, you know, I'm surprised that they started a right hander, and, you know, I was just excited about playing in, you know, the final game. And another thing, Oscar, uh, you know, Billy didn't take any left handers out. They kept bringing left handers to make Billy change, but he, he never he never changed. And, uh, and uh, and you had your wraps against the left hand uh, uh, pitchers. And of course, Chambliss was hitting lefties all year long. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you know they were trying to decoy. They wanted us to uh, take our lefties out early. They were just you know a decoy. They started the right hand and then they were going to run the left and right in there. If you get in trouble, then you know they could take our lefties out and then they could bring another right in on it. But we stayed with the left handers and you know we just stayed in there and played hard. It was just a foul all the way. That's yeah, something. Uh, the feeling on the team uh, in the last of the ninth winning with a home run has got to be the most dramatic shot since uh, since Bobby Thomas. I just was afraid Chris was going to get hurt running down around the bases. Well, yeah, you know, I know they'd be coming out, you know, like, and I start grabbing gloves. No, soon he hit it, you know. I went and put my glove down inside. I said, now, Chris going to hit a home run here. We're going to win it in this inning. So I took my glove off the step so, you know, they couldn't get it. And he did, and I was, it was just excited. Well, Oscar, I think it's great that Trey brought you over for Dobson, and you're a Yankee and a Bennett winner, and We've waited so long for it, and I'll let you go along to the party, but thank you, Oscar. Congratulations. And good luck in the series, too. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar's just getting a big kiss, and not for me, either. We're down here. Uh, uh, I know Mel Allen is upstairs. Is John Sterling downstairs. Uh, the clubhouse is uh, 
has been held off, and we're on a phone uh, between the interview room and the um, the clubhouse. <laughs> you know, I don't uh, I don't know uh, when I've been a party to anything uh, more dramatic and. Uh, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, the Royals, of course, got uh, the winning run uh, on second and the uh, other run on first base and a really ground ball to short and Greg Nettles made a big play cutting the ball off and, and forcing the runner at second base and then the last of the ninth inning, uh, Chambliss hitting a home run. Hey, Mickey Morabito, um, first of all, congratulations and all, uh, let's see if we can get Roy White or so. Mickey Rivers would be great. We can, you can get Mickey before he goes to the other side. Spencer Ross there, hi. Uh, wild scene uh, downstairs with the press from all over the world. And, in fact, really all over the world. They've uh, seen this game coast to coast. And, uh, I, you know, how could, how could it be more dramatic? Ninth inning of the fifth and final uh, championship game and a home run by uh, the big guy, Chris Chambliss, who's been getting the big hits all year long. Uh, Munson was great tonight. Uh, Mickey Rivers, Roy White, great tonight as always, and uh, we really got to give some due to, to Kansas City. Uh, they played such a tremendous series going down to the uh, to the uh, to the ninth inning and battling back when they were three runs down with uh, the George Brett. Thank you, darling. Just got a kiss. I took it. I want it all by myself. <laughs> How did you do that? I was cheering. I was cheering from the first to the seventh. Uh, what happened on the eighth and ninth? Eighth and ninth, the fans got weak on me, you know, and I got pissed about it. <laughs> no, no, no other word for it. Uh -huh. Hey, here, here is Mickey Rivers. Can we get him a second? Here is Mickey Rivers, and Mickey, you know, the Yankees wanted you to get on base. They could win the game. What did you do? Four straight hits. You scored runs in three of those innings. You started every rally. Congratulations. Thank you, John. And that's what we need to do. You know, I told the guy before I go out there, I'm going out there with 100%. I'm going out there and get four hits. Let's go three runs. And I hope they have enough for us to win the game. But so they believe in me and they trusted in me. I said, yes, I'm going to do it for you all tonight. It's my game. I'm going out there with that thought in my mind. And I said, I'm going out there and get the four hits and do it. Yeah, a lot of people were down. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people were down when Mayberry hit the two-run home run, and Mickey came up in a triple right away. Now you know they're going to score at least one run. The Yankees came back and, and tied it up. You had one hell of a game, but you also had one hell of a season. You know, you're playing out with the Angels. People don't know how good you are. How many balls you cut off in center field? No more tweeners against the Yankees. And um, I think you got to run up with Munson and Chambliss for the MVP in the American League. Well, thanks, John, but we're number one. Well, long as we're number one, that's all I played for this year. This was my goal to get there. This one spot is all I wanted, and I accomplished that, and I'm glad. I'm happy. Mickey, uh, did you have a feeling in the ninth inning about Chris? Oh, no, yeah. I didn't know we were going to do it. We just had that. We said we're going to do it, and I just know they're going to do it. We didn't drop nothing. We say we're going out there, we're going to win. We're going to win. We don't care what it takes to win. We're going right back and win. Oh, you're something super. Thank you. That was Mickey Quick. Mickey the Quick did it. And, uh, you know, you look at Mickey Rivers, right? The Yanks are down 2 nothing in the first inning. He leads off with a triple, scores. Uh, the Yankees are down 3-2. He comes up in the third inning and gets a base hit and scores. Uh, they're up 4-3 in the sixth inning. Mickey lays down the best bunt that I've ever seen and scores. The leadoff hitter getting on base with four hits in a row and scoring three runs as the Yankees won this game 7-6. We're in the, in the same area, and hopefully we can get one or two more people on before sending it upstairs to my uh, compatriot, Mel Allen. Mel Allen and I uh, sat side by side charting every pitch and every hit and every out in this game, and I think we're both equally nervous about this uh, unbelievable game uh, with uh, Thurman Munson's over there. Maybe we can get Thurman on. He's surrounded by a lot of well-wishers, and he's... Uh, fairly near the uh, interview room, but outside of it, and um, hopefully, uh, this phone cord stretches about an inch and a half, and hopefully we're going to get Thurman on live with us here as the celebration continues. In fact, the celebration's going to continue, so the Yankees go off to uh, 
Cincinnati uh, tomorrow. Uh, they probably will get a plane uh, out, I guess, late morning or so and um, get to Cincinnati and get a workout. Now, Cincinnati has the artificial turf, a very fast turf, as you might have seen if you watched the uh, series between Cincinnati and Philadelphia. The uh, Reds won, uh, the Reds won a game similar to this to win the third game in the final game. They swept that series, and you saw a lot of uh, base hits, extra base hits, with the ball bouncing all over the uh, uh, that fast turf at Riverfront Stadium in, in Cincinnati. So I'm sure the Yanks are going to get there in time for a, a workout uh, tomorrow. And then the series opens Saturday afternoon and Sunday night in Cincinnati. And then it comes back here to Yankee Stadium, the first World Series in the new stadium and the first series at the stadium since 1964 when the Yankees play the St. Louis Cardinals. They'll play Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night in Yankee Stadium. And, and then, uh, should there be a, a sixth and seventh game, they'll be back in Cincinnati both afternoons on the on the final weekend, the, uh, the week from from this coming weekend on Saturday and and, and Sunday afternoon. Seven months and pouring champagne on the head of Carl Blunquist. <laughs> A long time uh, friend of ours and a uh, friend of uh, the Yankees. Here is the uh, vice president of the American League, Bob Fischel. And Bob, uh, you had uh, a tremendous series um, for the for the American League, and uh, you're happy. You're just about having this great series, and having the whole nation uh, watch this series go down the ninth inning. Just fantastic. Uh, you know, that, this game is so great. Last year's World Series, this year's uh, American League Championship Series. We can't have a better sport than this. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Bob. Bob, uh, 56,000, almost 57,000 jamming this ballpark in a few years from now. Uh, there'll be about 200,000 people over here. That's exactly right. I've had that experience before. But it was a thrilling game, and the fans here are just marvelous. It's awfully tough for White Ears, Doug, and the Kansas City Royals, and I feel for them because they really carried the Yankees right to the end. But, but they didn't do it, and uh, the Yankees did, and it was a tremendous victory. A five-game series, and it goes down to the bottom of the ninth inning. I think that's about close enough. Sensational. Just sensational. It was. But, Bob, I thank you. I, I, you've been rooting for somebody because you've lost your voice. Uh, Bob Fischel, the vice president of Lee McPhail of the American League. And uh, I guess Bob can't say it officially. He's got to be a little happy tonight. Uh, Bob, a longtime Yankee. He was their PR director. Here's Thurman Munson. Thurman, can we get you for a minute? Thurman said no, and he walked away as he's getting ready to go into the party. And... Um, I guess we could go on with this uh, forever. Uh, uh, other Yankees will be going in the hallways, but uh, I think we've uh, caught the spirit of what's happening tonight here at, at Yankee Stadium. It was happening. Uh, you know, you go through baseball year after year, and you don't get too many pennants. Uh, the Phillies uh, won their first pennant in 1950, and uh, they got knocked out in the uh, in the championship series. All right. And... Um, I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Just talking to an old friend. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, the Yankees uh, not in a, a, a pennant or divisional playoff since 1964, and it goes down to the final game, and, and they win in the last ninth inning uh, with a home run, which is written in the storybooks. Uh, but this is real life, and in reality occurred in, in Yankee Stadium tonight. So uh, it's really something, and uh, it's one uh, game... Uh, that we're going to remember for a long time, and obviously we're very glad we could have, have been a part of it. I hope you have caught kind of the spirit. Of course, WMCA will be carrying the World Series beginning Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon from Cincinnati, and then um, the next week uh, in, uh, in from here on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, we probably will be doing this scene again, hopefully a uh, winning championship scene, but we'll be uh, doing our pre- and post-game shows uh, next week uh, during the World Series. So uh, we have uh, exhausted uh, the Yankees in the hallway for the moment. I think we'll go up to the stairs to Mel Allen, who can cap off our um, our uh, post-game show. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And for those of you who want to talk about it, we'll talk about it tomorrow evening. We'll have three hours on, no game on tomorrow night. We'll talk from 7 to 10 on the talk show tomorrow evening. So right now, let's go back upstairs in the radio booth to uh, Mel Allen. Recently, a survey was taken of the prices of premium gasoline. The survey covered hundreds of service stations in the northeastern United States. Virtually every major oil company was included. Right now, I'd like to tell you the results of that survey. In Portland, Maine, Getty Premium sold for less per gallon. In Boston, Getty Premium sold for less. 
in northern New Jersey, Philadelphia, and New York, Getty Premium sold for less. In fact, in every state where Getty gasoline is sold, the survey showed Getty Premium sold for less per gallon than most major premiums. More premium gas for your money. That has to be the best mileage ingredient you can buy. So the next time you pull in for gas, pull in for Getty Premium Gasoline. Getty. Once again, we've got what's best for your car. And so on Thursday, October the 14th, 1976, the New York Yankees, in an amazing finish in the last of the ninth inning, a home run crashed by Chris Chambliss, gave them the American League pennant, the 30th in their history. A ball game that lasted three hours and 15 minutes, so that at 11.45, on October 14th, I'd almost forgotten we're past midnight, so that it is really now the 15th. On the first pitch, served by Mark Littell, Chris Chambliss sent nearly 57,000 fans into absolute ecstasy with that line drive home run over the right center field fence. It was a ball game, a seesaw struggle. I repeat, for those of you who may have tuned in late, in which the Kansas City Royals and the New York Yankees, each with two wins and the best three out of five in the divisional playoffs for the American League pennant. The Royals scored two runs in the first half of the first inning. The Yankees came back with two. And the Royals got one in the second to go ahead three to two. The Yankees got two in the last of the third to go ahead four to three. Things settled down for a while, but the Yankees picked up two more in the sixth, and it looked pretty good as they led six to three at the end of six. But Kansas City still in there battling under the leadership of manager Whitey Herzog, who originally had signed with the Yankees going way back, though he never played for them, came up with a three-run home run off the bat of George Brett, who had committed a uh, costly error earlier in the game to tie it up at six all. And then the last of the ninth came the home run off the bat of Chris Chambliss. And the victory went to uh, Dick Tidrow. The loss charged to Mark Littell. The starters were Leonard for Kansas City, Dennis Leonard, and Ed Figueroa for the New York Yankees. And thousands of people covered the entire playing field of Yankee Stadium. Right now, they have finally left, and there's just nothing but litter anywhere you look. They set off bombs, and they set off firecrackers. And they yelled. They paraded with their signs. And they kept yelling, we are number one. And number one they are in the American League. And for those of you who may have just tuned in at a time when you normally might have been listening to Barry Gray, at a time when you would be listening to Long John, and of course Long John will be on uh, very shortly, I have one other thing that I'd like to do right after this message from our sponsor, Getty Premium. If you're like most buyers of regular gasoline, you probably think unleaded gasolines just don't perform. Sure, unleaded gives you a nice, clean engine, but it just doesn't have the pep of your regular, or for that matter, the low price. Well, you regular buyers are in for a little surprise. Introducing Getty Unleaded Regular. Getty's unleaded gasoline has a high enough octane to be classified a regular. Most unleaded don't. Yet Getty Unleaded Regular actually sells for a couple of cents less per gallon than most other major no -lead. So if you want the octane performance of regular and the clean running smoothness of unleaded for a couple of cents less per gallon, you want Getty Unleaded Regular. Getty Premium and now Getty Unleaded Regular. We've got what's best for your car.
In the American League Divisional playoffs, unlike that that occurred in the National League, as the Cincinnati Reds swept the Philadelphia Phils in three straight, winning two in Philadelphia and slamming the Phils as the scene shifted to Cincinnati. The Red Legs sitting around waiting to see whom they'd have to play in the World Series, which starts Saturday. The American League playoffs started in Kansas City. Billy Martin sent Catfish Hunter to the mound against Larry Gura, who had started out the season for the Yankees, who had come on strong at the end of the season, and Whitey Herzog decided to start him. But Catfish Hunter pitched perhaps the best game of uh, the year as far as he was concerned. In fact, it, it was the best game that he had pitched this year, and he beat Kansas City 4-1. to one. But the Royals came right back to defeat the Yankees 7-3 to three in Game 2, which was started by Dennis Leonard, who was the starter tonight, but he was relieved by Paul Spritorf. Spritorf got the win. Ed Figueroa started for the Yankees and was charged with the loss. The scene shifted here to Yankee Stadium with a day off for traveling, and the Yankees took a 2-1 to lead as they beat Kansas City 5-3. to Doc Ellis pitching beautifully, relieved by Lyle in the ninth inning. Hassler was charged with the loss as the A's used five pitches in that ball game to try and stem the Yankee tide. And then yesterday, Kansas City beat the Yankees 7-4 to to even it all up as the Yankees tried to end it yesterday. Kansas City won it 7-4. to Gura started against Hunter. Bird got the win, though, for Kansas City, and Hunter was charged with the defeat. And here tonight at Yankee Stadium, before the largest crowd of the year, 56,821, it looked as if the Royals, on the momentum of their win yesterday, which tied the series at two games apiece, this was the payoff, got two runs in the first inning off starter Ed Figueroa, who had won 19 games during the course of the year, had wanted to become the first Puerto Rican to win 20. He only won 19, though. This would not have counted 20 insofar as the regular season was concerned. But I can tell you this, in his mind and in the minds of his fellow Puerto Ricans, they would have counted it number 20, and we'd have all been glad to have counted it at number 20. But the Yankees struck back quickly as Rivers tripled, and White got a base hit, and Munson singled, and Chambliss they got a sacrifice fly, and the Yankees had tied the score at two all. And in the second inning, after Figueroa had gotten the first man, Rojas single stole second, and Martinez then came through with a base hit, and it was three to two Kansas City. But the Yankees went ahead four to three in the third. Again, Mickey Rivers, who got on base his first four times up, and the guy that starts things rolling for the Yankees, single to center, and White walked. And Munson uh, came through with a base hit. And there was a force out at second. The Yankees got two and led four to three. And that was the way it went until the last half of the sixth inning when Mickey Rivers again came up. This time he beat out a bunt to the pitcher to start things rolling for the Yankees and was sacrificed to second by White. And Munson came through with a timely base hit. And once again, Chambliss came through with a timely base hit. And there was a throwing error by George Brett, and the Yankees led 6-3, to three, and it stayed that way until suddenly the Royals exploded in the eighth inning. Ed Figueroa, who had settled down and pitched magnificently after allowing three hits over the first two innings, he blanked the Royals until the eighth. When Collins opened with a single, Martin came out, took him out, and brought in Grant Jackson. Jackson gave up a base hit, and George Brett then hit a drive into the right field seats for a three-run homer, and all the excitement here at Yankee Stadium disappeared. The score was tied at 6-6, but I've already told you about the finish. You've heard that over and over. In the last half of the ninth inning, Chris Chambliss hit the first pitch 
the very first pitch over the right center field fence for a home run that brought the Yankees their first pennant since 1964 and the 30th in their history. And back here now from downstairs where I know it was Bedlam is John Sterling. John, you called it. Well, Mel, I want to tell you something. I, I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. I was pacing at that point, as you know, with Joe Garagiola, Jr., the legal counsel of the Yanks, and I said to him, look, get a door open to the Yankee office so I can shoot through and get down the elevator when Chambliss hits a home run. And darn if he didn't do it. And, uh, you know, I then disappeared. I had to get downstairs and get to that phone in the hallway. I didn't see what the, uh, happened to this field. It looks like one of the streets in New York during the winter. Well, let me tell you what you missed out here. And, of course, I was telling uh, the people. As a matter of fact, I kept telling them over and over, waiting to get word that you right, were downstairs. Right. You know, I know how difficult it is to get through that crowd because they have writers from everywhere, not just New York writers, but... And not just Kansas City writers, but writers from Buffalo and Washington. I mean, Baltimore and Washington and the everywhere. West Coast, everywhere. It's like a World Series. And do uh, you know that there were, I would have to estimate, of course, uh, somewhere around six to 8,000 people on that infield. You can see right now where you know, patches of grass oh, have been torn up. Looks like and bottles. they were lighting off, you know, setting off fireworks, lighting fuses. And started yelling and parading around. It was just... I have one question before we get off. Uh, Long John, Neville, and Candy Jones are waiting very patiently by. Uh, Did Chambliss ever get to home plate? He finally uh, did, I think. I I, I lost him in the crowd. I'll tell you one thing. When he turned second, I I still wonder whether he ever touched second base. Because somebody (laughs) grabbed that bag, and I don't think he ever touched it. But after all, according to the rules, he made his effort. The fact that somebody may, I say may now, because the crowd had gathered around there, and you, you just couldn't see. You saw them grabbing that bag, and uh, I saw him turn his head to look back, but uh, I don't think there was, there was no second base there. Well, that is really, well, we'll remember that forever and ever and ever. That's a Bobby Thompson-like home run that Chandler exactly said. what I said a little while ago. And he has done it over and over and over again, the home run in the third game to turn that series around and bring the Yanks in the game that they eventually won and. And tonight, and it looks, uh, buddy, that we're going to be working again together during the World Series. And it has been great, this uh, five-game American League Championship playoff. Uh, baseball has never been better than the past couple of years. And well, I've certainly enjoyed working together with you, John, as you know. And I've said that to you uh, privately. I've said it uh, publicly. And I want to say just this one last thing. It was a beautiful way to finish here at Yankee Stadium where they had won 29 pennants previously, and this was the 30th, and they had done it basically, as they say, on power. Right. Uh, but they had great defense. Well, but if it uh, was power, it was power tonight. It was great. Our uh, post-game championship efforts have been brought to you by Getty Premium, new Getty unleaded regular of the higher-octane gasolines with the lower prices, and I expect we'll have a World Series preview on sometime a Saturday afternoon before the first game from Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, and I want to thank our engineer, Danny Bartolucci, here, who's done a great job. Our engineer back at WMCA, Hal Brown, our producer, Sid Gatling, who's been just tremendous tonight coordinating these efforts in two different areas of the stadium. And I'll see you Saturday, uh, Mr. Allen. And, uh, and stay tuned now for the people who really own the nighttime in New York radio, Long John Nebel and Candy Jones. This is John Sterling from Yankee Stadium. The Yankees are American League champions for 1976, and have a very good night. Rouse Communications in New York. Coming up, Long John Neville and Candy Jones. Hey, what do you say? Well, good morning and welcome to the Long John Neville Candy Jones program on 